Welcome everyone to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast. I'm a networking expert and the author of the upcoming book, No, No Strangers, How to Build Community, One Relationship at a Time. My why is the pursuit of mastery, and the goal of this podcast is to lock arms on a lifelong mission of daily personal growth to become the best version of ourselves. So let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We are joined by a very special guest who's achieved a level of mastery in his field. He was Finger Eleven's drummer for four of their most iconic albums, including The Grayest of Blue Skies, their self-titled album, Them Versus You Versus Me, and Life Turns Electric. If that wasn't enough, he then went out and started the supergroup Saint Asanya with Three Days Grace singer Adam Gonchier. So welcome to the podcast, Rich Bedo. Rich Bedo. Uh, Rich, how are you? And how good does it feel? to finally be out there playing live shows after a two-year lockdown. Well, hello, brother. How are you, man? It's good to see you. Um, and thank you for having me and that beautiful introduction. Um, it feels great. It has been a while since I played, um, especially live. So I just, I, I'm in like this real moment of gratitude right now where I'm not taking it lightly that you know, this is kind of a third chance I've gotten where a lot of people, you know, a lot of people that I know don't get a first uh, opportunity. So I feel incredibly fortunate and um, I'm enjoying it, man. The more that I interview musicians during the pandemic, the more of a sense of gratitude that I'm getting from them, because there are points, I mean, I just saw Billy Talent live and, and Ben, the singer was saying, he was crying several points during the the concert because he said there were points during the pandemic where we didn't know if we would ever get to play live again. So that's a big deal. I'm going to see those guys actually um, in a few weeks in Germany. So it'll be nice to catch up with them. That's amazing. So one of, one of my all time favorite bands is called winter sleep from the East coast. Yes, Amazing. And I, when I went to see Billy talent out of nowhere, I'm looking at the drummer. I'm like, that really looks like Winter Sleep's drummer, Lowell. And later on, they announce, and we have our new friend Lowell on the drum kit. So uh, oh, wow. so there's like an inside connection. I had Winter Sleep singer Paul on the podcast recently, which was a part of my, you know, uh, all-time list of guests that I would love to get on. So there's an inside sure. connection with Billy Talent right now. And I, I think Billy Talent's original drummer has, I think it's MS, so it's hard for he him does. to play. Yep. So Alexis yeah. on Fire's drummer has been filling in, but now with yep. the pandemic, live musicians haven't made money. So Alexis on Fire is back on tour and yes. there's a conflict with Billy Talent, Alexis on Fire, and in slides my friend Lowell from, from Winter Sleep. So. Oh, wow. I actually text uh, Jordan yesterday um, asking him if he's going to be in Germany, but um, he hasn't gotten back to me yet, but Lowell, man, that first winter sleep record is amazing. The first song on that, the way the drums come in, changed the whole, not the time signature, but you're just not expecting it. And I think, um, is it ghosts? Is that their song? Ghost? Uh, weighty ghost. Yeah. Weighty ghost, man. I think that should have been an international hit. That to me is like the perfect song. I don't know how it wasn't a big hit at radio. It's, it's genius. That song. What, what's funny is I've seen these guys like 20 times. My band opened for them like 13 years ago. And oh, wow. I remember seeing them live and suddenly they play this weighty ghost song before it was a hit. And it sounded nothing like the band. And I'm like, what is this song? And then after that, I hear it. It was a, a pretty big hit on radio in Canada. They won a Juno right. for it, all that stuff. But yeah. anyway, so that's Winter Sleep. Um, mm-hmm. I'd like to share with our listeners how we got here today. So I'm a big believer in the power of networking and building community and relationships. So yeah. uh, back on episode number 34, I believe, of the podcast, I had uh, I had Rick Jacket of Finger Eleven on as a guest. And in preparation for that interview, uh, I found you on Facebook and I sent a friend request, never knowing what's going to happen. Um, 
you accepted the request, which is awesome. I don't know why. And then um, <laughs> the last episode I just did was with super producer David Bottrell. I mean, this guy's my hero, yeah. done tool albums and Muse and Stained and all these guys. And yeah, I, I was preparing some quotes for him so that he could feel the love of um, how much people admire him and, and love the work mm -hmm. and cherish the work that he's done. And I saw that you and David Bottrell were mutual friends. So I reached out to you and just said, Hey, I have David Bottrell on. Um, do you have any kind words you can share about him as a producer, him as a person? And you ended up sharing one of the most memorable, most authentic, most genuine, most vulnerable and transparent quotes I've ever had on the podcast. Uh, it meant a lot oh, wow. to him. And when we connected over that, you mentioned, hey, I'd love to be a guest on the podcast. I believe I have a story that's worth hearing. And here we are. Yes, here we are. Yeah, that was really cool when you asked about um, a quote for David. Um, that was a real honor to, to be able to do that. And I just sort of sent something um, in the moment, you know, that I felt really not prepared. And, you know, what what was said there was very real and very you know, how I felt. It wasn't very manufactured. It was just, you know, you asked me what I thought and that's what I thought of that guy. And he is, he is a giant in the music industry and a really, really great guy. So I was honored that you asked me that. So once that episode went live and it got out there, you were able to see the clip of me reading it and of him actually responding. So sometimes, yeah. you know, sometimes the guests just say, Hey, that's very nice of him to say, but David actually went on and talked for a few minutes about you and about that moment. And you yeah. reached out to me and said, man, that the clip of you reading that and him responding made me cry. So what was yeah. it about that moment that, that really got you in the fields? You know, that time period is there is, I guess, darkness and shame and just there's not a ton of <clears throat> positive memories from that time. So but that night hanging out with David um, has stuck with me. So I guess even just to hear that he remembered that evening hanging um, and just, you know, when when someone hears something about themselves and you can tell they're touched, it, it then touches you. So it was just beautiful to be a part of your guys' conversation. The fact that my name was even in there with a conversation with David Bottrell, uh, you know, was stunning in and of itself. And, and just hearing that he was actually aware that you were in a tough spot and, and he yeah. felt like he could actually offer some support was, uh, was pretty amazing. Yeah. I, you know, it's one of those things that I certainly, I remember it vividly and I'm sure, I'm pretty sure I remember I was probably awake for a few days leading up to that hang, but, you know, sitting and hanging with him and then kind of walking through Liberty village in Toronto up to, um, you know, a spot that he stays at was, it was just a really, uh, it was a very real moment. And, you know, I'm just glad that he knew I was going through stuff, you know, cause I mean, it would have been pretty obvious, but, you know, being a producer that he is, I, you know, I thought, I thought he might at least be able to help and he, and he really did, you know? So. Yeah. As, as a producer, you have that kind of intuition and that sixth sense and, and yeah. knowing what's needed to, to help the musicians get to where they need to go. So sure. it, it would be a failure on my part if I didn't reach out to David Bottrell and get a quote for you. So this is from super producer, oh, David wow. Bottrell. He says, okay. Rich's body of work speaks for itself. He's a master drummer and has been the solid engine for many projects. I look forward to the day when we get together in the studio and we create something fantastic. So that's from David Bottrell. Oh, wow. Wow. That is, that's a lot to hear, man. Yeah. Already, it's already starting, dude. It's already starting. The tears are going to flow. And that's beautiful, man. Wow. I, I gave you a heads that. up, bring the Kleenex because I, I went, <laughs> I went deep on this, on this episode. So and um, you, I, I'm the guy that cries at the Tim Hortons commercial at Christmas time. So it doesn't take much. <laughs> you're, you're the guy that they're making those commercials for, which is, yeah. which is funny. Indeed. So we, yeah. man, we have so much to dive into between mm -hmm. the, the four finger 11 albums, all the touring, the St. Asanya, there's other stuff going on. And I'd like to go back to the very beginning. So people sure. know you as this rock star, this super talented drummer, the face of different <laughs> bands. 
but but you know you're not born a rock star you're not born with this talent so i'd like to take it back to the beginning and and right. go back to your earliest musical memories is there a, a time where music for the first time ever suddenly jumped out as being something important to you yeah you know it's there is and i think it's sort of a cliche answer because i've heard other uh drummers say this but when i was really young the muppet show was you know a big show on on tv and animal from the muppet show i just you know he always caught my attention and it, you know i used to look at what drums he had like right away i'm like oh look how many cymbals does that guy have and i just i got to the point where i started acting like him in my house and my parents would tell me to stop i started talking like him and this was years before i ever got a drum set um so around that time i think i guess it was a little later but um Bands like Run DMC were big at that time in the early 80s. And for some reason, I was already gravitating towards, I didn't know that it was drum machines back then because I was so young, but just it wasn't so much the rap back then that I was paying attention to. It was those, you know, those drum machines and just the, the groove of it. Um, so, yeah, I didn't know what I liked, but I looking back, it, it was the drums, you know, so I guess it was always rhythm got me, but. I went through a little stint where I wanted to be a guitar player too. I, I was a, I wanted to be a pro skateboarder first. And uh, Steve Caballero was my favorite. I was a Powell Peralta guy. Me and my wife were just talking about that last night. It's funny. Um, but yes, I went through a skateboarding phase. And then for a second, I got, my dad got me an acoustic guitar. And on Christmas day, I got it in a little box. It was a really shitty one, I'm sure. But I remember my dad like pretending he knew how to tune it and bonk, the string broke. And my whole house thought the guitar was broken, you know, and he looked at me. I think I started crying. Like we didn't know that you could replace a string. So we took it into a store to like get it repaired. And looking back now, the guy at the store must have been like, oh, my God, this guy just broke a string and they're bringing it in like it's destroyed. But, I, you know, I kind of lost interest in that pretty quick. And um, I jumped around again with the skateboarding. And just when you're a kid, you have all these different interests. When I did um, start you know, letting my parents know that I wanted to be a drummer. And um, they made me go to drum lessons for, I think it was at least a year before they wanted to get me a drum drum set because they're expensive. And, you know, a kid that age, you could be into something for three or four months and then move on. So they got me a $50 snare drum and a little rickety stand. And, uh, and I went to, I started drum lessons in Kitchener. And I just, you know, I had the snare drum. I was on my bed, the snare drum and a pillow was my hi-hat. And I just started learning through my teacher, whose name is Dan Todd. And he's a Kitchener guy and he was in Platinum Blonde. I think he's still in Platinum Blonde, uh, you know, a Canadian 80s band. Um, oh, what is going on here? Yeah. So why is this? Something just came up on my computer. Sorry. It's, not, it's um, a, a software update or something. That's all good. Did you? Did you see that come up? No, too? everything looks fine on this side. That's oh, okay. all good. Yeah. So it was a year after just playing that snare drum that on Christmas day, um, we would always get our big gifts in our house at the end of the Christ. You know, we'd open all the presents that my parents would bring down the, the big gift for me and my brother and my sister. And that Christmas they brought down two presents. I think my brother got like an old snowboard back in the day, like plastic ones. And my sister got something and there was nothing for me. So I, I think I was just trying not to cry. You know, I, I couldn't understand why I didn't get something. My dad asked me to go down. My dad asked me to go down to the basement and get some garbage bags to bring up, you know, put all the, the wrapping paper to throw it away. And I went down there and sure enough, there was a sparkly red drum set waiting for me that they had set up again, looking back, they didn't know how to set it up. So the, you know, it was all set up funky and stuff. I, my mom and dad in the middle of the night, I can kind of picture them trying to set that all up, but yeah, it was, a. Uh, I still remember that, you know, and I was like 10 years old, but I remember walking into that like laundry room in the basement and seeing that and bawling my eyes out. <laughs> 
So, we, I mean, we have enough guitarists, so I'm glad you ended up gravitating back towards the drum drums. Yeah. And what, what's funny is, you know, most people, when you talk to drummers and it's like, how do you get into drums? Their idols are like John Bonham and Neil Peart and yours is animal from the Muppets, which is, which is yeah. badass. I like that. In animal, animal and an eighties drum machine. <laughs> and yeah. That's very, is maybe that's why you have a unique drumming style. Um, <laughs> Would you believe me if I said that I have inside information on that on that Christmas where you got that drum kit? And if I said I had inside information about those drum lessons when you were growing up, would you believe me? Um, well, let's hear it. Let's hear it. I, I, you know, knowing you, I do believe you because I know you're uh, you do your research. So let's hear it. So I have a very lengthy quote here. So bear with me, okay. but it, it all deserves to be read. A very okay. lengthy quote from that drum teacher, Dan Todd, drummer of Platinum, of, of Platinum Blonde. So here we go. Awesome. So Dan Todd <laughs> says, I remember meeting Richard for the first time when, we, when he would have been about 12 years of age. I was teaching him at Sherwood Music in Kitchener. Richard stood out more than all of my other students. He had a real natural ability for the drums and he picked up everything really fast. See, he's calling you Richard. That's how long he knows you here. So uh, I remember <laughs> when Richard told me about him getting his first kit, it was Christmas and his family all opened their gifts. And if my memory serves me correctly, Richard's father asked him to go to the laundry room and grab a garbage bag for the wrapping paper. Richard opened the door to a brand new red pearl kit. And I got choked up when Richard told me years had gone by and I knew of Richard's success, but had completely lost touch. I was on tour with Platinum Blonde and we were booked to play the Minidosa Manitoba Festival. We mm. arrived a day early and I heard Finger Eleven was playing. So I went down to the festival backstage and I knocked on their bus door and Richard and I reconnected. I am beyond proud of the drummer, the man, and the father Richard has become. Richest blessings, my friend, from Dan Todd, drummer of Platinum Blonde. Wow. Wow, that's amazing that he remembers the, the Christmas story, you know. Uh, he's such a great guy. And, you know, him calling me Richard isn't a surprise because he's just, he's such a gentleman. He's such a kind-hearted, warm guy. Um, and I always watch him on Instagram. He's such a great husband. Him and his wife are, you know, they look so happy together, but that's incredible, man. That's really, that's really beautiful. I do remember in Manitoba, him coming and it was our dressing room, not our bus. I remember our singer, I was, there was two rooms in the dressing room and he came in and said, do you know Dan Todd? And I was like, what? It's like, he's at the door. So yeah, I do remember that very well. And uh, yeah, what an honor to learn from him, man. Great drummer and great human being. Did, did you play in any bands growing up? And if so, what is the worst band name you can remember having? There's been oh. some pretty funny ones on the podcast. Here. Oh, man. Well, I got it. I bet I can top it. So originally I was in a band all through high school. I was in the same band uh, with a bunch of guys and, and we worked hard. We were, you know, we five, six nights a week. We were rehearsing. We weren't really rehearsing. We were writing songs from a really early age. We did we had a period where it was Metallica songs and a few Queensryche songs. Um, <clears throat> but the band was called Alliance back then, which not so bad of a name. It's a good name so far. Yeah. Alliance is pretty good. So um, a few years later, the Randy the, who sang and played bass, I think he decided he was just going to sing. And we got this guy from Cambridge, Helder Consequeo to come in and play bass. And we changed the name. I think he might have came up with it, but we changed the name to Reptilian Psy, like a Psy, like S-I-G-N, like hmm, a Reptilian Psy. That was the new name of the band. And we had this, uh, this, this thing that was going to definitely get us signed. What we we're going to do, we we're going to write these songs and then we we're going to send our, our cassette tapes to these record companies. And with it, we were going to get vibrators made up that said Reptilian Cybrators. And for sure, we were going to get a record deal by the Reptilian Cybrator. So we had a big plan, but I think we spent more time talking about that plan rather than um, writing songs. But yeah, Reptilian Psy, my friend. I don't know if you can top that. <laughs> you know what? I think if you actually followed through with that plan, you guys might have got signed. You might have been the biggest band in the world, but we'll never know. Possibly. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> As a kid, 
Was there anything that you wanted to be when you grew up before realizing you wanted to be a drummer? Yeah, a professional skateboarder. I was a, I was a huge, I mean, in the early 80s, I guess, well, Powell Peralta, when Tony Hawk was a kid, <clears throat> and um, Lance Mountain, Steve Caballero, all the Powell Peralta guys, and then Rob Roscoff on Santa Cruz, and Christian Hosoy, all these guys were, they were superstars back then, to me. Um, you know, always on the cover of Thrasher magazine and Transworld magazine. Um, so back then it was the dream of becoming a professional skateboarder. And I mean, me and my brother and our friends, we skateboarded all day, every day from, you know, morning till night. And I was pretty good. You know, it was such a different kind of skateboarding back then. Now these guys are, I'm not even sure how they do what they do. Back then it was like Ollie over a sewer. Um, kick flips were just kind of starting. They weren't even really impressive because they were kind of like, uh, but it was the, um, making ramps on the street, like street ramps, trying to do backside airs, um, you know, grinding on sidewalks, um, pretty basic stuff compared to now, but that was my dream to be a big superstar to join Powell Peralta's team and, you know, be skating beside Steve Caballero and Tony Hawk. And then came the drums and I'm like, whatever get out of here skateboards <laughs> we we had the same dreams as a kid so i first wanted to be a goalie in the nhl then i wanted to okay. be a professional skateboarder so i got the same oh. magazines for christmas under my stocking uh mm -hmm. and then and then came music as well um if ipods existed back when we were 16 what music would i find on your ipod so probably run dmc anything else no, well no because uh if i was 16 run, run dmc would have been back when i was you already Canada gave them the boot by 16. How yes. dare you, sir? The, yeah, you're, you, are you Canadian? The boot? The about? The boot. Yeah. The boot. Uh, so it's 16. It would have been um, Queensryche, Operation Mindcrime, or Empire. Those two huge records in my life. And Scott Rockenfield, the drummer, still a uh, huge influence to me. Uh, Metallica. At 16, it would have probably been, I guess... And Justice for All, in between and Justice for All and the Black album that was coming out. Um, Testament, uh, Testament, Slayer, all like the metal stuff, you know. But then always, I always was still a fan of Run DMC, the Fat Boys, Houdini, the Beastie Boys. That was always there, but I kind of started to hide it. You know, when you're 16, you don't, you're just unsure of yourself and your confidence. So I was just a metal guy. So I don't know if I told everyone then how much I still like that, you know, 80s hip hop, but it was mostly metal, man. And Metallica being the number one. Metallica changed my life as a musician and um, so much so that we tore, I toured a bunch of years ago in like 2001 with Ozzy. And during that tour, Jason Newstead was filling in for that summer. He had just left Metallica. And, you know, I'd been touring for a long time at that point or in, quite a few years and I'd met lots of different musicians and it, it had become somewhat normal to do that. But when I first saw Jason Newstead, you know, backstage the first day, I think in Vancouver, I couldn't even speak to him. I was so nervous. It's like all that, all those memories of being a fan of Metallica for all those years came back. And literally the whole tour for, I think it was three weeks. I'd never said one word to him. And what, the one time we were in the catering room and the video for good times came on. So it was whatever, whenever that record came out, 2003, I believe 2003. Okay. So I was in the, I walked in the catering room and that was on and he was eating and he looked at me and he was like, Hey, I know that guy. And I literally just went like that and walked out of the room. <laughs> so he, you know, I don't know what he thought, but he definitely knew I was scared to talk to him. So I really regret that man. You know, that's you funny. Know. You, you, He's spoken to you, but you've never spoken to him, which is, which is kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Metallica's bass player that they got after him is it? it's Robert Trujillo, I think. Um, Trujillo, maybe? Trujillo. So didn't he come from Ozzy? Like they did a swap? Yeah. I sure believe did. that's true, which is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. They like swap yeah, he partners. Was, he was with Ozzy and I think um, Infectious Grooves and Suicidal Tendencies as well. He's... Yeah, he's a monster player. But yeah, they definitely did the swap. 
I, I saw Metallica in Ottawa probably, I don't know, 15 years ago. It was Godsmack opening for Metallica. What's cool about Godsmack is that Sully Erna, the singer, um, he was a drummer as well, right? Yeah. So they had a, dr- a double drum kit going on, which was cool. And then I saw yeah. Metallica a few years ago in Toronto at uh, the, the Sky Dome, the Rogers Center, whatever, with like 50,000 people. Man, those guys wow. are so good. So good. Yeah, I saw them on their last tour. They came through um, a friend of mine, but more so my wife uh, works with Metallica. So um, she surprised me. We got in the car one day and we started driving towards Grand Rapids and um, Metallica were playing that night. And so we got to the arena and she surprised me. He got us in and we got front row. I've seen Metallica a bunch of times, but to be front row and their stage is always really low. So, I mean, you're, you know, James's feet were right there. So after all these years of being, you know, the ultimate Metallica fan, just a couple of years ago, I got to see it in all of its glory up close. And it was, man, it brought me back to being a kid. It was amazing. And their production is always so crazy. It's like a spectacle. But I saw them on the Black Album Tour at least three times, um, the Death Magnetic Tour, the Load Tour. Uh, so, yeah, huge fan. You you were within the blast radius of their concert right up front. Right. See, yes. see, that's how you know you need to lock down your partner for life is when when she surprises you with Metallica tickets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Can you rapid fire through all the jobs you had before becoming a professional drummer, maybe focus on, on the worst job of all, if you can think of it. Um, okay. I sold Cutco knives, you know, I think people will know what that was. I, so I went, I had to buy this set of knives myself. My parents bought it and I was going to people's doors and doing this 20 minute, um, thing where I had to cut a penny and show them these knives. And it was, I mean, I don't know about that company at the time. It seemed like it was a pyramid scheme. The guy that I worked for was just a big crook. I think, I think he ended up going to jail, but so Cutco knife salesman, um, the hardest job I ever did was roofing. That was unbelievable. And the last day I worked doing that, I was climbing up a ladder with a bunch of shingles and the ladder just started tipping. And one of the guys grabbed it. And I mean, I, I could have died. So I think I put down the shingles and I was like, I'm done. I'm going home. So those two jobs, what else? I mean, I did a bunch of stuff. Um, I'd say the roofing was the hardest and the worst. You know, getting up, being in the sun all day up on those roofs, and it was really hard. Man, I have a lot of respect for roofers. They are tough fuckers, man. Absolutely. I swear on here, by the way. You just did. So, yeah, now you can. We, we, okay, we broke cool. the seal, all right. so it's all good. Um, how okay, how cool. early on did you know that you had something special to offer as a drummer and that that was something you wanted to do as a career? You know, I, I knew I wanted to do it as a career from a really young age. Um, almost immediately, I used to go to shows and I was more fascinated with, I'd go in the back and just look at the tour buses and imagine what it's like to travel on a bus. I was fascinated with buses when I was young and just the whole lifestyle. I would just lie in bed thinking about what it would be like to be on the road um, and playing those shows and traveling, you know, around the world. So from a very young age, I, it's all I really, besides skateboarding, it's all I really remember is being um, just, you know, over the top. It's all I wanted to do in life. I mean, yeah, laser focused on it, but in, you know, a childish way growing up, but, I don't know as far what was your first question about my drumming? How did you, why did you poison? When did you know you had something special to offer? Oh, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I've ever thought I've had something special to offer. I think I've just always loved drumming and stuff. Um, Yeah. I'm not sure if I have anything more special to offer than the next guy, but you know, it was a passion. So so when we're young, we're, we're often told, get a good job, uh, you know, get a good education, get a good job, play it safe. Did you ever have a fear of not being able to make a living uh, in, the, in the music industry as a drummer? I never did. I never thought about money. Um, even like I never thought about being rich and famous. I just thought about being famous and, you know, and living the life of a rock star. I could never picture myself make you know, millions of dollars and the whole idea of living in mansions and, and sports cars. I never, ever had that fantasy. It was just about, 
you know, the rock star part and playing those huge shows. But so probably um, it was probably a negative thing growing up because I, I never had money and I just used to live in the worst um, places, you know, mouse infected, mouse infested <laughs> homes. And I was okay with it. You know, as long as I was playing drums, I, I didn't care if I had enough money in my pocket to like to eat something and maybe drink some beer. I was completely happy. And I thought I'd always be happy with that. And, you know, especially with Finger 11 and the first, definitely the first two records, we were all living at home with our parents. So we would go off and do these tours and we would all come back to living in our parents' basement. So I really didn't need then, you know, a lot of money to survive. It was just, you know, I'd come home and basically we lived off $25 a day per diems back then for years. So again, if I came home with a few hundred bucks after being on the, on the road for months and I could like party with my friends at home for a few days, I was completely happy with that. How did you end up getting that audition with Finger Eleven? R- rumor has it, it it's a chance encounter at an Alice in Chains concert has something to do with it. It, it doesn't have something to do with it. It was just a, a huge coincidence later. Um, so originally I was playing in a bar band from Hamilton called uh, The General Lee. Those guys are still my good friends. Uh, there's also a band in Hamilton called um, uh, Freedom Train. And the singer and bass player of that band's name is Carl Jennings. And he's amazing. Um, his brother plays drums. And damn, I wish I remembered all three of their names. But they're such a great band. And one of the nights Carl filled in with our bar band, the General Lee, I think in Newmarket, if I remember correctly, we were playing just a little bar, you know, doing the three sets. And he had mentioned that the Rainbow Butt Monkeys, they were called that before Finger Eleven, um, were looking for a drummer because he was, I guess, Sean from Finger Eleven was taking some bass lessons with Carl. So I think Carl you know, got me the number for Sarah, which was the manager of Finger Eleven back then and got me an audition. And they, you know, they were in Burlington and I was in Hamilton. So it was kind of easy to, to make that happen. But I just knew the Rainbow Butt Monkeys. I didn't have any, I didn't know anything about Finger Eleven or that there was even a record out. <clears throat> so I learned, I spent all the, you know, a few weeks learning that Rainbow Butt Monkey record. And I think it was the night before I was going in, I heard, I think Scott and James, on 102.1 and they were talking about first of all finger 11 i'm like what finger 11 they've changed the name and then they played quicksand on the radio and it's a pretty tricky song to especially to hear for the first time and i just panicked so it w- probably wasn't the night before the first audition it was re- it was coming up real quick so i learned that right away and i think above and i think one more song and i went to burlington to this um rehearsal place i think called the music gym it's probably still there and uh yeah and i set up and i played those songs and they went really good and they said you know i i think james came out that night to watch me play with the general lee and then it was do you want to come back for another audition so i went in for a second one but the whole thing was i remember being terrified you know the whole thing was i was so nervous but yeah that's how the first thing happened Man, those Finger Eleven songs, Quicksand and Above, are so different from anything on the Rainbow Butt Monkeys album that that must have been a shock for you last minute. Absolutely. Yeah, those records, or that record was more funky Chili Peppers stuff. And then to hear Quicksand, <laughs> this weird time signature. Yeah, but I loved it right away. When I, I remember on the radio, it must have been Above that I heard. Because when I heard Scott um, singing We Look Above at the end, like kind of screaming, the look we look uh, yeah i remember just being floored how badass that was and it's still badass still awesome scott's great so what do you remember from the rest of the audition process so you went in you did the first one it went well they mm-hmm. came to see you at night and then after that what what goes down what's what's happening the what's the song i don't even know our own songs um oh my god one of the songs from tip i'm so embarrassed i can't remember the damn name uh i learned it completely wrong so the i went in for my second audition and that was the first song we played 
and I remember I did it and then Scott, you know, cause Scott's a drummer. He has drum sensibilities too. He was like, yeah, that's not how that one goes. And I remember it really threw me off and it was a bad audition. And um, I'm so embarrassed. I can't remember the name of our song, but it wasn't shutter. It wasn't glimpse. It was uh, whatever it was. I fucked it up. So the second audition I left thinking, you know, I don't know if, if I, if I got this now, and then they were playing a show in Hamilton, you know, sometime that week. And I went to see them and they had a fill in drummer um, playing that show. And I went in the front row. It was at a Hamilton place, I think. And when I saw some other guy get up and start the show, I just, you know, the air was pulled out for me. I was like, Oh my God, they have a new guy. I lost the gig. And after the show, I, I got to speak to James and this guy I found out was not going to be the drummer. He was filling in. And James said something like, man, when you come back for the third one, like, you know, make sure you kill it, like come and show us. He said something that really got me amped, you know, to really do a good job. And I guess the third audition, I can't remember as much about the third audition. I just remember them saying, you got it. You know, I remember that moment, but I can't remember what songs we did. I guess I'm sure we did that song and I'm forgetting the name of, um, and I learned it correctly, but yeah. So I just remember them telling me I got the gig, but it must've went okay. How did you feel when they said you got the gig? It was my dream come true. All that stuff that I've been describing to you, it seemed like it was attainable and reachable. Now, I didn't know at the time that they had just gotten dropped <laughs> by the record company in Canada. And really, they were starting at the beginning. Um, and even when I found that out, it didn't matter. Um, it was the opportunity to go play shows, especially in America, you know, to go to New York City. The, the good thing about all that is once I joined, we, you know, we started looking for a new deal. Um, and I was there for the whole grooming process from different labels, flying down, you know, to New York and or Los Angeles, I think, and labels taking you out for dinner and playing showcases. And that's such an important part of a, of a band or a musician's journey to, you know, to, to be a professional musician, I guess that whole experience. So I'm really grateful I was there for that. And then us picking the record company and going to New York and, you know, signing the record deal and all that stuff. Um, even though I wasn't there from the beginning because it sort of, there was a part two of all that, you know, tip came out twice. I was able, even though I didn't play on the record, you know, was part of the whole thing. So someone else that auditioned at the same time for finger 11 is three days. Grace drummer, Neil Sanderson, when he was a yeah. teenager, uh, there's a funny story to be shared about Neil also auditioning. Do you want to share that story? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think the day before I came into that first audition, this kid came in named Neil. And I remember they described him as playing different. Now we all know, I mean, drummers know how Neil plays. It's, uh, I don't know how to describe it. You know, it's kind of backwards, not backwards. It's a very unique style that he has. His ride cymbals up here. He plays open-handed. And, uh, and he's an animated drummer as well. So he had a great audition that same day. Another guy named Neil came in and he had a horrible audition. I guess he was a horrible drummer. <laughs> so the next day or whenever it was, they called this kid Neil back and he got there and they realized it was the bad drummer. They had called the wrong Neil back. So he would have got the gig had he have, you know, had they have called the right guy. He 100% would have got the gig. So, so, yeah. so I have a quote from Three Days Grace drummer Neil Sanderson. So here we go. Oh, cool. He yeah. says, Three Days Grace started as a Finger Eleven ripoff band. I'm still pissed <laughs> that they didn't pick me as their drummer after the tryout when they found out I was only 17. I drove all the way to Burlington with only a G1 license. He's breaking the law here to make this band. Uh, they said they <laughs> called the wrong Neil, LOL. I thought my life was over. I still have no idea how they can have their guitars completely above their head. And it still sounds in tune and heavy as fuck. I really miss those dudes. That's Neil Sanderson drummer for three days. Grace. Would you agree that things worked out for Neil Sanderson? He'll be okay. Right. I think he's done. All right. I can't remember. Yeah. I think he sold a couple of records, had a couple of songs on the radio. So yeah, he's, he'll do okay. But 
Um, I saw him somewhat recently. We're still good friends um, to this day. Where did he play? I, whenever they come through town, through the Michigan area now where I live, we always hang out. And um, yeah, he's such a great guy. They're all such great guys and always have been. But me and Neil have definitely always had a great bond, you know, as friends. And he's such a killer drummer and great dad, great everything. I love him so much. I, I saw a crazy stat the other day that three days grace has the most number one uh, active rock or alternative rock or modern rock songs on the charts in U S history. They have like 20 number one singles, which is like unbelievable. So crazy, man. Yeah. I, I heard that as well. Um, and they deserve that. You know, they, they know how to write, you know, the, the, the perfect song for the radio and they're, and they're great songs. You know, they're, they, they get to the chorus fast. The chorus is always catchy. The music's always interesting. I couldn't think of a better band to have that stat. You know, they're, they're awesome. And, they're, you know, so proud they're Canadians. So we have our first fan question. So this is sent okay. in from Selge Menard here in Ottawa. And he cool. says, or his question is, how do you do insane flips with your drumsticks, throw them in the air and make them land just in time for the beat to drop? That's his question. And my question is, were you doing any of, of those antics during the auditions for Finger Eleven or did that come later? Well, to be completely honest, I've never thrown my sticks up and caught them. I don't know what he's remembering. I've never been the guy to throw them up, catch them. I, I guess I've done, I play, I do certain things, but I've never been the guy that, you know, I've never done the twirls. I've never thrown. So not once, I not once in, in history have you, has a stick left no. your hand and returned? So, and So sometimes I, if you hit your floor tom a certain way, it will just fly, you know? So sometimes at the end of songs, I would just boom, but I would never try to catch it, catch it. It would just be gone. But so I, I you know, I, he's probably just talking about the overall style of playing, I'm, I'm assuming, but uh well, I'll follow up with another question okay. that is yeah. similar. Okay. Um, so you have a very active and powerful drum style. Uh, you're not just keeping time in the back. How did you develop that, that style where you, you're also a showman? It's like you're an active part of, of, of the live show. Well, well thanks. Um, honestly, I get so nervous or I always got so nervous when, when I was first started playing with, with the guys it w I was much stiffer and um, to my recollection, it was almost unenjoyable because I would be so nervous and scared and, you know, I would want the show to be over and then, you know, look back at pictures or think about it after and sort of enjoy the memory. But I was anxiety and fear were getting the better of me during the show. So as time went on, I think the more I went on stage and, slowly started going into a mode where I guess I wasn't completely myself, the less anxious and nervous I would feel. And over the years, it just became, you know, I guess more and more of that where it just started coming out that, you know, in my brain, when I went on stage to drum, it was like that guy kind of took over to play, but really it just derived from being nervous. And if I did, if I became that guy on stage, it was, I was in the moment, I was enjoying it. It was, wasn't over the top. And, you know, that's sort of where that came from. And a lot of that stuff, I guess, because it came from just, it's almost like protecting myself. It, it's not like it was rehearsed, you know, sometimes I look back at footage and it, it's kind of embarrassing, like what, <laughs> but it, it's just sort of becoming another person out of necessity almost like a split personality, you know, some people over the years called me Mr. Hyde, or they would just call me Hyde because, you know, it'd be like from, from rich to Mr. Hyde, but it, it's cool to be, it's cool that that's a thing, but I always wanted to make sure that my actual playing and what I was servicing the song, you know, how I was servicing the song was um, the most important thing. And I think for a while there, that did almost overshadow it. So, but you know, so it's a combination of that nerves um, and just, and well, another thing is you have Rick, you had Rick and James on stage. So I was looking at those guys all the time. And I mean, how can you not follow in the fun when you're watching them have so much fun? So literally uh, that is a part of it too. Like 
these guys are getting into it so much and I'm part of this band, you know, over time there was the nerves and also watching them and it, it just all developed somewhat naturally, but it, it was, I always had the best seat in the house watching um, Rick and James do their thing for sure. Yeah. They say you're, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. You're an amalgamation of the five people. So when you're surrounded by Rick and James who are, uh, who are crazy on stage, throwing their guitars and whipping their hair and jumping around that by osmosis, yeah. you, you, you become a part of that universe. Um, sure. Back when you auditioned for finger 11, you found out that you got the gig mm. tip mm -hmm. is, is in, in the, you got it completed. It's just not out yet. At that point in time, could you have ever predicted that finger 11 would go on to be one of the biggest bands in the world around the time of one thing and paralyzer? Could you ever, could you, is that what you thought <laughs> when you made the band or it was just, this is the next step? Well, well, I mean, I, again, I got to correct you on saying the, at the time, one of the biggest bands in the world, we definitely were not ever one of the well, band, that Paralyzer was one world. of the biggest songs in the world. I, we got to say it, that. It was. Yeah, sure. I, definitely that year that one was uh, that was played a lot. But no, I could never predict that. And I think, you know, we had a slow build. We were we didn't have a, really any hits in the States for years and years until one thing in Canada, we started um, developing, you know, some success pretty quickly so we were able to you know tour Canada and sell out big clubs you know like thousand seaters and stuff and then we the rest of the year we would uh, be in the states opening for bands playing you know rooms for like 200 people a night <clears throat> and the big thing is we traveled in a van uh, a lot of bands that we toured with back then would very quickly get a bus and they'd get like four or five crew guys and six months into touring, you'd see them just drop off and go away and because their tour support would be gone. We always were really um, smart about how we spent money. And I, I believe that that's why we were able to still continue touring when really other labels probably would have dropped bands because we weren't costing them a lot of money to do it. So we stayed in the van for a long time. We only had two crew guys for a long time. And I got to give um, Sean, the bass player of Finger Eleven, all the credit for that. He was the the money guy. He handled all that stuff, and probably the personality that he is. He, you know, he's got a an amazing but quiet, reserved personality. And I love him to death. But probably that guy being the money guy, um, he was the best guy for it because you know we weren't making stupid decisions with finances. We were kind of the opposite. So, and it didn't matter. <clears throat> excuse me, because <clears throat> we were living at home with our family. So, but then a few years into it, we started touring Canada with a bus. <clears throat> so it was kind of like a tease. We do two or three weeks in Canada. Then we have to get back in our van and do the rest of the year <clears throat> in the States. But so we could never imagine, you know, because of all those years of having not real success, just, we were just sort of there. But some people knew who we were in the States. Um, I guess we'd gotten kind of used to it. So when one thing came out and it was, you know, it was so huge and it was, it, it was a big change for us, but it was one of those songs. And I think Paralyzer that was the same kind of thing where you, a lot of times you'd have to sing the song <clears throat> for people to know the band. It wasn't like you said, finger 11 and they'd say, Oh yeah. You'd say finger 11 and they'd go, huh? you know, if I gave it all for one thing, they go, Oh yeah, I love that song. <laughs> you know? And the same with Paralyzer finger 11, never heard of it well, I'm not paralyzed. Oh yeah. I love that band. So we were always sort of the faceless band, you know, with a couple songs on the radio, but yeah. So the slow build of our career was, uh, sometimes it was hard, but it was great looking back because nothing was ever overwhelming and everything that each step of the way, any success we had, we, we enjoyed and we, you know, we didn't take it for granted, but so, yeah, no, I could never have predicted, um, you know, starting to do like the Tonight Show, Jay Leno Show, all that stuff. When that started coming in after like three records of none of that, I think that was on one thing. You know, we knew something had definitely changed. When you're playing the Jay Leno Show or, you know, the Gino Awards, you know, you know, something has definitely shifted in the band. Rick had mentioned that uh, 
it was always, you know, the band was known as Finger Eleven and, you know, the brand name of Finger Eleven, people knew and then knew the songs afterwards. But Finger Eleven was the brand until Paralyzer, where Paralyzer, that song eclipsed the band and, and mm-hmm. became bigger than the band where where the yeah. song was known. And it was the band name kind of attached to that song. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And it, it's like I was just saying, if you said, uh, <clears throat> if you ever heard of Finger Eleven or someone mentioned Finger Eleven, it, most times people would say no. And then you'd sing the chorus of Paralyzer and they go, oh yeah, them. So definitely, you know, the word Paralyzer and certainly singing the chorus to Paralyzer had become much bigger than the word Finger Eleven or the words Finger Eleven ever were. <laughs> so I have, cool. I have a, a fan question. It, it <clears throat> This actually seems like more of a comment. So okay. uh, this is from Eric Clermo. He says, the first time I saw Finger Eleven was in 2000 at a big festival where there was a ton of other big bands. Finger Eleven was easily the best band, and I've seen them eight more times since then. So just a nice statement. Wow. Wow. You know, those that's very nice. Uh, Those big festivals still are amazing, especially in the States. There's a lot of them in Canada. I guess there's more than there used to be. Edge Fest was the big one in, you know, in Ontario, Toronto. But in America, they're all summer long. And that's really where you get to know a lot of the guys and other bands. Um, and, you know, with finger 11 for many years, we were the band that were on it like one in the afternoon, often on the side stage or like the C stage. So again, your, when your the, light show isn't doing too well at one o'clock yeah, in the afternoon. Yeah. Well, we never had a light show, <laughs> but you know, we would play and because um, for some reason, other musicians, you know, started to, to know and like the band often we would be playing early and, you know, especially the three days grace guys would be watching and the seven dust guys. And to us, that was much cooler than having the, you know, the huge crowd in front of us, getting the respect from our peers was, you know, was amazing. So yeah, still to this day, I've been, you know, so lucky to do a lot of those festivals and I'm about to do some coming up here. Uh, They're the best, you know, although you wish you could play a little longer. It's usually like, 40 minutes or you know six songs or something but definitely cool there there's the pros and the cons of being on the festival right the pros is that there's a huge built-in audience you're networking with other amazing bands you can add those bands to your resume and then kind of the 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 cons is that it's much shorter set and and yeah possibly you're on during the day but uh let, yep. let let's dive into the album the grayest of blue skies so this comes out in 2000 this is your major label debut uh yep. what what um emotions thoughts memories come back to you when you think of that album that really started this epic journey for you um well i the big thing is working with arnold lanny um we went into his studio pretty immediately after we got off the road i remember we had a rehearsal place in hamilton and we had started writing and it was i do remember it was just stale this uh, not a lot was coming down coming out it was a really shitty um rehearsal room upstairs in downtown hamilton it just the whole vibe really sucked and i think arnold had a free studio and you know he just finished an our lady peace record which was uh Clumsy. This was the the no, diamond. No, it was, was after uh, that. It was the next one um, with uh, in repair on it. What's that record? You know about the the machines. Uh, Spiritual machines. Yeah, it was that one. So he had just finished that record, and the studio was open. So instead of writing in Hamilton at this room, we sort of moved into his studio in Toronto very quickly without songs, without any songs written. And we stayed there for six months and we sort of wrote and recorded as we went. And at that time, uh, wind up the record company had a scream three was coming out the movie and they had for some reason got the rights to like all the music on scream three. So I think all the bands on that soundtrack were wind up record bands. So we had an, a chance to be on that soundtrack. So the first thing we did there was record the song suffocate which I, get, I think we wrote at the studio too. So we recorded a mixed mastered and sent that out before we had any other song done. So it was sort of like that was, you know, we already kind of knew what we were going to get, the sound of this big Arnold Lanny sounding record. And then we had to go back and, and finish the, 
you know, the whole record, but yeah, a lot of the songs were just built from the ground up. I, we, I remember writing drag you down and it was Arnold sitting in a room and really constructing that song. I, I would, I would dare to say writing that song, you know, and we were just, you know, the vessel from him throwing ideas. Uh, and it was like that with a lot of songs on Grace the Blue Skies. Arnold was a, you know, a massive piece of the writing or, and the sound of that record. Another thing that probably a not, not a lot of people know is <clears throat> most of the drums on that record are V drums. That was when Roland V drums first came out and it was this new, you know, these new pads were the new amazing thing and Arnold had just got them. And sorry, sorry, V drums are what an electronic drum kit or electronic drum set. Yeah. Um, so I think we set my drums up and then we had a V drum kit beside it. And when we were working on songs for it to be quieter, I just would play these V drums, the headphones on, but they were getting these huge sounds in the control room from these drums. So it, I kind of, I, it bummed me out at the time that, and I real, honestly, I think Arnold, you know, I was so young and we were trying to get this record done, especially the drums, which are done first. I'm not sure if Arnold had complete faith in how long it would take me to do it with V drums. You could just record and edit it. So we recorded the drum parts. Then I believe we did the cymbals after recorded them, which I know three days grace did on their first record too. just, you know, takes out any bleed in the drums. And then we started adding acoustic drums more as ambient stuff. So in broken words, one of the songs in there, we had a huge bass drum, like a 28 inch bass drum. And I made a mallet out of a sock taped up with a drumstick and we just, you know, we're hitting the bass drum and we had it super compressed. So, you know, in the control room, it was like, boom, this massive, almost an 808 sound. And so the, a lot of the bulk of the drums were electronic drums. I was playing them, but those sounds were coming from triggers <clears throat> and all the uh, un stuff underneath, you know, were real drums. Like in Drag You Down at the start, there's two drum tracks going. One's a real track, one's the V drums. And then sometimes in the songs we'd have a real floor tom with the drums. Every song was different because we were, like I said, we were writing them as we were recording them. So we didn't go in with a bunch of songs and start. We would do this song, work on the drums, write this song, work on the drums. So at the time when the album was done, I think I was a little, um, what's the word? Like I wasn't proud of the fact that it was, that most of it was electronic drums, even though I played it. And I remember a specific memory of this feeling is right after we had done finished the record, we went on tour with Creed, or I think we just played a show with Creed. And we were in the back of the bus with Scott Phillips, the drummer. And I think I came in after when they'd already listened to a few songs and he was with Rick. And I guess Rick had mentioned how we recorded it. And I know Scott didn't mean anything by this, but it just crushed me <laughs> that I sat in the back lounge and he, went, he looked at me, he was like, you recorded with V drums on this. And just the way he said it, you know, just took the air out of me. And I was like, Oh my God, why, why is that bad? Or, and I just questioned everything. But now in hindsight, that record still to this day, it sounds so fucking great. Um, the guitar tones are, are amazing on it too, but the sound of those drums are, make a big part of that record. But um, what you're hearing are triggered sounds. So I'm not sure if you knew that or not, but that's one of the secrets to that record. Yeah, I didn't know that the drums sound sound great. So you would, yeah. you would never know. Yeah, well, I mean, these days drummers are <laughs> hardly are in studios anymore. It's you can program drum parts now that are so real and so you know so cool. And a lot of rock bands, I don't think, would want to tell you do that. But I know tons of bands right now that the drummer's not even doing anything in the studio anymore because it's you can do it all sometimes a lot better than a human could. So, which kind of sucks to be the drummer, but um, you know, it's not always the case, but it's certainly a lot of the time. So we were sort of the pioneers in doing that, I guess. <laughs> uh, a lot of drummers are equal parts drummer, equal parts programmer, right? They get good at, at the days, programming. Sure. So at least they still have some control of their drums. So yep. uh, on that album, Drag You Down, First Time, Bones and Joints, those were the big singles. Uh, in, in Canada, they did very well. What was it like hearing your songs on the radio for the first time? So yes, you were a part of the promotion of Tip that had, you mm -hmm. know, um, Awaken Dreaming and Tip and Above, and there were singles on that, but 
technically sure. you didn't play on those albums. So what was it yeah. like hearing these three singles on the radio, knowing that that is you? Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because as we were re releasing songs from Tip, other drummers would talk to me and they'd find out it was another drummer. So them not knowing the backstory <clears throat> that it came out before me, that Rob was in the band and had left the band. And, you know, the whole story of how I came to be there. Because when we re-released re Tip, I was in the CD, the picture. So then it said in the sleeve, drums by Rob Gummerman. So it's, it looked like I was replaced in the studio. So after dealing with that for like two years of touring and to finally know I'm part of this record, you know, for real, that, you know, to me was a big thing as a drummer. But I think the first time I heard Drag You Down was at the, um, maybe the Bovine Sex Club in Toronto. I went there with some friends from Cambridge, I might've had it and asked the guy to play it. And um, that first um, guitar squeal that comes in, I don't know if it's a Wawa or what that is. I remember that in a club and just, it's like the whole place was, you know, th there was this reaction. And um, another first memory I have is playing first time for Morgan, uh, Morgan from seven dust, the drummer, Morgan Rose. And <clears throat> I remember us all sitting in a little room I think it was that same show I was talking about that we played with Creed. Um, it was us, Seven Dust and Creed. And I remember Morgan reacting to first time and then calling the other guys in the band from Seven Dust in and listening to it. And just, I could see that they were listening to the production and you could see their eyes, you know, widen. Like uh, I knew we had done something cool. Um, as time went on, I, I'm not, I think some of the other guys in the band at some point in our career were just didn't like that record for whatever reason. But I always was very, very proud of that one. Probably to me, it stands out of all our records as sort of the, the you know, the pinnacle finger 11 record to me. So that album comes out in 2000. I'm 15 years old. The drag you down music video comes out. Mm. I, I, I love the song. I love the image of the band and I'm going to share something with you now sure. that you will either find endearing or, or you will be traumatized. So I'm going to okay. share my screen. Okay. I've never done this before. So hopefully this works. Let me know if you can see this. Oh, so, yeah. so this is me at 15 on the left and <laughs> I copied, and this is you on the right around the time of the drag you down music video. So yep. I, I thought your hair was the coolest thing that ever happened in rock and roll. So I bleached and spiked my hair like yours mm -hmm. and it ended up getting longer so I could have it, you know, coming down like yours. Mm -hmm. Look at, look at the necklace. Look at the facial hair. Amazing. So Amazing. when I show you this, part of me is proud. Part of me is embarrassed. And I feel but like, like Stan in the Eminem song, <laughs> right? Where it's like the obsessed fan. And then right. what makes this even worse is if you look at us right now, we both have black shirts and black shoes. <laughs> but a beard, yeah, and, I'm a little more gray, but yeah. And this this was not planned. So anyways, yes. I'll stop sharing my screen. But for those that are just That's listening awesome. to us, I shared a picture of him as an inspiration for what, to me, a rock star should look like. So. Oh, wow. Uh, that is, that's not weird or creepy at all. That's fucking amazing, man. And it's funny, I'm holding the Naughty Boy Dread Wax. Um, yeah, that, I just started growing dreads um, while we were recording Grace of Blue Skies. I think it was the House of Lords in Toronto. I went and got, you know, it was super painful. They were, it was the beginning of dreadlocks. Um, so that's what that was. And I, I don't know, I think that's super cool, man. I love the little, the facial hair and everything too. We yeah, both I'm, look, I know you look very young in that, but I also look very young. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed and slightly proud oh, by that. Dude, but uh, no way. it's cool. Anyway, so Grace of Blue Skies, this was your first gold record in Canada. This is your first, mm -hmm. your first Juno nomination. This is for rock, I think a rock album of the year. What did those two things mean to you? The gold record, um, getting the gold record, which in Canada are <laughs> kind of small. You know, you always picture like the gold record, a big thing on your wall. Um, but just to get that thing to put on my wall. And I got one made for my, I think my mom and dad and my brother and sister. So I got like four other ones. That meant something as a symbol that, you know, that I had, 
I guess, gotten to a certain level and achieved something, uh, even though, you know, 50,000 records is not a lot of records. It, it just symbolized, um, I guess that I had made it. Uh, and I remember we got, um, they presented us those awards at Edgefest in Molson Park. I remember. So that was the first anything I, we'd ever, I think we got a scream three gold record first before we got that one. So I had, we all had one of those on our wall, but to get a finger 11 one was massive. And I still have that downstairs in my house right now. So I believe that the grayest of blue skies is the darkest um, and heaviest finger 11 album. Uh, oh, sure. Do you, do you agree with that? And why sure. do you, why do you think that is? I, I, on a side note, um, Rick mentioned that that was probably the hardest album to make. So just mm. putting that out there. Right. Um, well, I think at the time, you know, age has a lot to do with it. We were younger. Um, I think a big part of what made that heavy was Scott. Um, even if you look at the way he looked back at then, there was, we just had a different angst because we were younger. Um, I'm sure the bands we were listening to at that time, I know me and Rick definitely were loving corn back then. Um, yeah, I think it just was our age and what was coming out from our experience, you know, touring the first record. And it was just what came out naturally. Um, the subject matter in the studio with Scott. Again, there was so much of that record was done. It's like Arnold Lanny was really a band member on that. So everything you're hearing on that was as much Arnold, in some cases more than any of us. But you know, they spent so much time recording guitars. I mean, we were there for six months. And a lot of that was guitar and experimenting. And there's so many different sounds and, and things back then. So I could see Rick saying it was the hardest record to make. Um, but we were young and we... You know, and we were, I don't know if we were angry. We just had angst, which I think is a different thing. We were eager and angst. And uh, I don't think we ever set out to make a heavy record. That was just what came out at the time. So, yeah, I don't know what it was, man. But as the years went on, definitely the band's um, influences changed. I, Scott was never really a heavy dude. He, you know, he was always a singer songwriter guy. So, I don't know if looking back, if that would be his favorite record. I think, you know, he preferred singing over screaming, which I'm sure most singers do, but um, some of the stuff on that record to sing was really difficult, especially as years went on, on his, on his voice. So unfortunately there were songs that we wanted to play later um, that when we were doing headline shows, we're, we're just, you know, to play every night we were damaging for him. So, you know, I know drag you down for a while. We, we weren't playing it just because it was like the potential of him blowing his vo voice up. So it was like a 22 year old singer versus a 32 year old singer singing drag you down. It's, it's harder on his body and voice. So yeah, youth, man, youth and angst, I'd say is the answer. So I infiltrated the world of, of world-class drummers for this interview. Okay. So I okay. have a quote from one of my all-time favorite bands. So this is from Chad Selica from Breaking Benjamin and yeah, Black okay. Label Society. So I probably butchered his last name. I apologize. So this is what Chad says. I love that man. Well, what can I say about Rich? He's a great musician, drummer, and now a great father. What he brings to drums is showmanship, the creativity, pocket and groove. I've had the pleasure to do shows with him actually festivals. Watching him play is unbelievable with the passion he brings and the talent he possesses. I'm also a huge fan of his drumming and his bands, not to mention he is a great human, heart emoji. I got to add that. I love that guy. So that's from Chad from Breaking Benjamin. Wow. Yeah. Every time you're doing this, I get like, ah, I get teary, man. I love that guy as well. And he is one of the best drummers I've ever toured with um, by far. And that guy practiced all day at festivals, always was practicing. He's such a man. He's a remarkable player <clears throat> and he's an amazing guy too. And it's really beautiful to hear him say that stuff. I mean, I don't know. I, my heart is blown wide open when I hear that in all the best ways, man. That's really great, but great guy. I, you know, Bre breaking Benjamin, uh, 
Sean, their drummer now is such an awesome guy, such a great drummer, two different guys, two different eras of the band, um, both amazing. And uh, that's, that's beautiful, man. I love Chad. He, man, he's a powerhouse drummer as well. I, you know, I've seen those guys live so many times and, and he, he, he is very visual too. He does some real cool. That's stuff. what I was going to say that he he's like you where, you know, it's, it's like a car crash. You can never look away. Like once you spot you or him on the drum kit, it's like you forget about everything else and you're just zoned in on, on those guys. So in, in, in 2003, you guys release your self-titled album. I'm going to read just a few, a few accolades here. So that's your first okay. platinum album in Canada and first gold album in the U S. So Things, things are progressing in the right direction since the yes. grayest of blue skies. There's five singles, Good Times, One Thing, Absent Elements, Stay in Shadow, A Thousand Mile Wish, two more Juno nominations, Group of the Year, Single of the Year. If I were to say that this is Finger Eleven's best album right up there with grayest of blue skies, <laughs> would you agree with that? Or is that erroneous uh, on all accounts? No, uh, a couple of things. That to me is the best um, record for me as a drummer, I think it's, I think I had the most part of the writing in that record and not that that makes it better or anything, but just a, that album is very rhythm um, driven. A lot of the songs, not a lot of them, some of the songs, you know, when we were um, writing them started as a drum groove and then sort of like absent elements, you know, the, those guitar parts and stuff are sort of built around the drum part. And th that didn't happen for any other reason. That's just what we were jamming that day and, you know, stuff like that came out, but I, I really love that record as a drummer. Um, baby's crying. Can you hear the baby in my audio? A little bit, but that's yeah. okay. okay. That's okay. Uh, you're that's you're a, yeah. a proud new Papa. So <laughs> yeah. we'll talk yeah. about that later. It's, okay. it's just, this is building the ambience for a segue yes. into that later on. Okay. So. Yeah. So the one thing about that, Rex, so as a drummer, it's uh, I'm proudest of that one as far as the playing, but unfortunately to be completely honest, I can't stand the sound of that record. I think it sounds like a demo, I, you know, I, there's just no low end on the album. When I listen back to it now, I, it, it, it really sounds like a demo. Um, I'm not sure why that, you know, why we made that choice or we were cool with that at the time. Um, Sorry. Do you think, think, do you think that's the recording of the album, like the tracking, mm -hmm. or do you think that's the mixing yeah. and mastering? What do you think that were the uh, low end the falls mixing, short? Mixing and mastering of it, you know, because you, yeah, we recorded with Johnny K, the same guy that did the next record. Um, all those low ends were there. I think we were just going for an in the room band at that time, jamming in the room real time. You know, it's a rock and roll band. Um, and we achieved that. I just think those songs would have been better serviced with bigger production. But that's just my taste. That's just how I feel. You know, the other guys in, in the band, I'm sure, have their own opinions, which there's no right or wrong answer. But so as a drummer, my favorite parts I ever recorded and wrote as a songwriter, I feel the most um, connected with how those songs were constructed, but as production of a record, definitely my least favorite. So let's, let's dive into a few of the songs on that album. So uh, other light, it kicks off the album with other light. I believe yeah. th that song is in six, four, or at least part of it is in yeah. six, four yeah. is, is it harder to play different time signatures? So I'm asking for maybe people that aren't musicians, is that harder to do or it's just another time? Signature? No, it, we, we never wrote anything saying, Hey, let's do it in this time signature. Like I was saying a minute ago, a lot of the songs were just playing a groove in our little, our rehearsal room was Scott and Sean's parents' house in a bedroom. Um, a lot of the stuff just came from jamming and, you know, I was never counting or nobody in the band was ever counting. It was just, we were all, I guess had been a band long enough that we were all in tune enough to know what our downbeat was. And that downbeat wasn't always a four, four downbeat. Um, so when we were in the studio, I think Johnny, the producer, sometimes would point out what the time signatures were. And I, I never really knew that. One cool thing about Other Light that maybe people don't know is not long before that, uh, Dave Williams from Drowning Pool had passed away. The singer? And those guys, yeah. Uh, those guys were and still are very, very close to me. Um, I'm still in touch with Mike, the drummer, 
very much still a dear friend of mine. And we were really close with Dave. Um, when he passed away, <clears throat> I think, it, you know, there was so much attention. They were, you know, doing really well at the time. And there was just so much media and stuff about that. Um, Mike and I was in Mike and I definitely Mike, the drummer called me and was like, Hey man, I know you guys are in Chicago. I, I got to I just want to get out of Dallas and just get away from all the shit. And because we were, you know, we had hung so much. I, I think he was comfortable asking, can you, can I come up to the studio and just not talk about that shit and just basically drink with us. So he flew up from Dallas and he stayed with us at least for a weekend. And he didn't realize, but before Dave passed away, Dave used to have this shovel on stage that on one of the songs, he would like smacked on the stage, you know, as a rhythm, whack, dun, dun, whack. And that was Dave Williams thing. At the end of that tour that we did together, uh, he signed it, all the guys signed it. And he, they gave me, he gave me the shovel, which was his only shovel he ever did that um, with, I, I think before he passed away. So it's a really, uh, it's a treasured item that I have. Um, so in the studio, I had brought it for some reason. So while Mike was there on Other Light, one of the first hits you hear on that record or the first snare drum you hear on that record, maybe the first intro underneath that snare drum is Dave Shovel. And we all went out and got super drunk and came back to the studio like three or four in the morning. And we put something on the ground and Mike did. I can't remember what it was, but each eye in the band and Mike took turns down and whacked it and don't whack and we all and we put that into the song so it was our it was our quiet tribute to dave and drowning pool and uh i'm so proud we did that you know and it was a big moment for mike too i think it was a great healing moment and i'm just so honored we were part of that um i still have that shovel and i've talked to mike a bunch about this i don't want to have it i think that thing deserves to be in like a hard rock or something in Dallas. Cause it's Dave Williams. I, I certainly, I don't, you know, it doesn't belong in my house. So Mike knows this and I know this when the time, when it's the right time and I'm able to get it to him, I don't own that drowning pool on that shovel. And I want to give it back to them. I mean, it's been an honor taking care of it, but it's such a, to me, it's a part of heavy metal history that deserves to be up on a wall somewhere. So right now it's on my wall, but not permanently. I want to give it back to those guys and whatever they want to do with it, but it, it's drowning pools. That's their property, not mine. It was, it was so heartbreaking when, when he passed away. I mean, he's a young dude and, you know, bodies had just exploded a huge single. Yeah. The album comes out yeah. doing well. The band is everything they've ever wanted is coming. And you find out that the, the singer passed yeah. away at a young age, man, that was, I remember that was a tough one. Yeah. And he was uh, one of those guys that everybody loved. You know, he was uh, when he walked into a room, he would light the room up. And, you know, his good friends were Vinny and Dimebag and they had the same personalities. And those guys were the first guys to take us to Vinny's house, Vinny Paul's house when we were in Dallas. Um, you know, I remember I think it was Dave and Mike. We were at Dimebag strip club in Dallas. And I think it was Mike leaning over like, dude, do you want to go to Vinny Paul's house tonight? And you know, so it, Drowning Pool are the reason I got to to meet Dimebag and Vinny and not just meet them, go party at their house. And we got to play Pantera's gear. And when Vinny Paul went to bed, he just kind of left us in his house and upstairs at his crazy mansion that he has. He had all the Pantera gear set up to, you know, to rehearse. So at like four o'clock in the morning, I was playing Vinny Paul's drums and uh, James or Rick were playing Dimebag's guitar and we were just jamming on Pantera's gear in Vinny Paul's house. So all of that happened because of Drowning Pool. Wow. I'm, uh, I'm going to read the next question because it's a little bit longer okay. and I don't want to uh, miss okay. any parts of it. So okay. uh, the song Complicated Questions, that's one of my favorite songs on that album. Um, great drums for the verse. And then when it gets heavy during the part, the tear out this love part, like that part's so badass. Mm -hmm. Um I believe that your drum playing is what makes the song unique. Do you remember coming up with your drum parts for that song? Uh, was the song built around the bass and the verse and the guitar and the chorus? Like those are all the things that jump out in that song for me. Um, again, so to be completely honest on everything, that beat in the verse was taken from a glue leg song from Toronto from their first record. I think, I don't know, I think it was an independent record. It's similar beat that used to, 
I used to always imitate the beat and always wanted to use it somewhere. I don't know if it's the exact same thing, but it was derived from a glue leg song. And I think, again, like I was saying before, just at a rehearsal, just jamming stuff, I started playing that groove and the guitar parts are picking up, you know, on the kick drum pattern. So it, it, it derived from a drum beat, but not with any intention of that being a tricky part. It was just a, a similar groove to something that I really loved about a glue leg song, who, who are such a great band. And like I was saying, that's how so many of those songs were written on that record, even though they were sometimes tricky parts, they weren't meant to be. They were just um, in the moment, but maybe I was trying to do something, not so much tricky, but something unique. Because um, we wrote that record took so long to write. I mean, we were up in that Scott and Sean's parents' house for well over a year writing songs. We had like 60 songs or something, ideas. Um, so probably after a while, we were just trying to keep interested and try different things. And that complicated questions thing, um, you know, came up And the chorus part. That was another part of the song where uh, the second half of each part are everything's following the drums. Check it, check it, check it, check it, check it, check Every, every chorus, I think, does a different thing. And uh, that's just what we started becoming. Um, really from first time on Grace the Blue Skies, picking up those dan and check it, okay, dan and check it. I think those judges, um, I know I started hearing those in a lot of songs later, not to say that we were the first to do that or, or people took that from us, nothing like that. But I, I just remember us doing that and then hearing it, uh, you know, all the time. And it was maybe just, that's what people were doing at the time. But, you know, fast forward to that record, we had then, even more so started picking up, you know, some of the bass drum patterns, the guys were accenting. And I think that definitely created some of the interesting time signatures and just sort of musical, you know, the drum parts and guitar parts of that record. So it was a very musical record, um, but not necessarily because it was meant to be, we weren't trying to be tricky. We were just trying to be interesting. Did you, did you, do you feel like you had more of a contribution to this album versus Grace of Blue Skies? Yeah, I had, I mean, I don't, I didn't, I don't have really anything to do with Grace of Blue Skies. I was so young and new to the band. I was doing what I was told, which was okay. I, I, I needed to be told that. Um, I, I really had no confidence back then. I was new enough to the band that I didn't have a voice or at least one that I was comfortable voicing at the time. So yeah, the, the self-titled record, we were, I was more comfortable in my position and place in the band and more comfortable suggesting things. And, and again, just the way we had wrote that, like I was, you know, just describing, it just happened to be a lot of those rhythms came from my drum parts. So kind of, therefore I had more contribution, contribution to those parts. So it was a fun time, man. We, like I said, we spent so much fucking time, <laughs> like over a year in this uh, bedroom that was like infested with flies, like infested with flies. And we would all be well, at least the four of us would all of our shirts off. We'd be covered in flies. And, we, you know, we just got so used to it. It was like, you know, in the eighties, you'd see those um, Ethiopian commercials, those off, you know, heartbreaking commercials. And um, there's flies all over those poor kids. We were like that. Um, a lot of those songs were written covered in flies. <laughs> it, it reminds me of the Amityville horror movies yeah. where the, yes. there was flies all over the, the windows yeah. and in the rooms that were, were haunted. Yeah, I can't even describe to you. It was that many flies. I mean, it, it was over the top. I'm sure there's video of it. Around that time it was when I first bought a video camera too. So I have almost everything from that self-titled record up till the end of me being in the band um, videotaped. I have all those videos here. I mean, I, I have probably hundreds and hundreds of hours that nobody has seen of us traveling the world. You know, Probably some of it nobody should see. But, you know, I, one day I want to get somehow get that all edited because I have like the ultimate finger 11 home video sitting right here beside me right now in this room um, that I hope one day I can get someone to put together with, with the guy's permission. Of course, I wouldn't just do that on my own, but make, to make sure that they would be OK with that, too. That, but, that, that reminds me of the new Kanye West documentary on Netflix. I think it's called Genius. And it's uh, some, someone that filmed like. 20 years of Kanye West, like before he was big all the way up to being the biggest star in the world. And it just shows 
like everybody turning him down. No one believed in him as, as a rapper, except him, like that huge confidence and ego. Like somehow he always had that despite the world telling him that that's, that's not you. So anyways, it, it, you know, someday it's like, it's, you have all the content to put out the equivalent of the Kanye West genius documentaries. Yeah. I haven't seen that. I got to check that out, but yeah, definitely. um, At some point I'd like to talk to the guys about, you know, doing that as a team, having someone edit that, but that's something I would never, you know, I, I would include them if I ever did that. Cause that's all of us, you know, that's not my property. It's our property. So. So continuing to move through the songs on the album, how much fun was it to play good times live with the awesome Tom work in the verses mm-hmm. with the awesome snare work and the breakdown? Right. Was that, was it a good time to play good times live? Yeah, well, here's a funny story about that one. Uh, while we were writing that record that I'm talking about in Scott and Sean's parents' bedroom, one of their bedrooms, um, wind up records, I guess we're going to put out the soundtrack for Daredevil, the movie. Um, so they had sent us a clip of that movie, still with the time code on it and stuff, like just an edit. And the scene was um, Ben Affleck up in the fan at a bar and kind of watching everybody. And then I think knocking out the lights and fighting all these guys in a bar. So it was like a, a two minute or three minute sequence. And they had asked us whoever, I don't know, it's a studio or who would have done that movie, but if we could write a song around that scene to be in the soundtrack. So good times. We were all sitting there watching the scene of Ben Affleck jumping down from the fan and, you know, fighting everybody. And the first thing I did as I'm watching, it was like, dun, 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 dun. on my bass drum of floor Tom, and I was watching it again. And that's literally where that song came from is a Ben Affleck scene in daredevil. So the song was created around that Tom thing that you're talking about while watching that move that movie little sequence and once we recorded it we went to los angeles um before we finished the self-titled record to we had met johnny k the producer and we were going to do that song for the daredevil soundtrack and and if things worked out we were going to use him as a producer for the whole self-titled record so we went to los angeles and we recorded that and um sad exchange so we thought Good Times was going to be on the Daredevil soundtrack and we thought Sad Exchange was going to be on the Finger Eleven record. And we just had the budget to record an extra song. That's why we did Sad Exchange. And I guess when it was finished, it was reverse. Sad Exchange was on the soundtrack and Good Times was on the record and became the first single off the record. So again, that was another song that was recorded a whole different time as the rest of the record at a whole different studio in Los Angeles. Um, The rest of the album was done in Chicago. So that's how that That's the backstory on all that. So with hindsight being 2020, now that Paralyzer is out, it's a big single. So I'm, I'm okay. This will make sense in a second. So now that Paralyzer is a song, it's a big single. This is out looking back Mm -hmm. to good times. I see it as like the pre good times is the precursor to Paralyzer where good times is like a hint of a change in musical direction for more of the dance, dance rock stuff that's coming. Do you see good times as a turning point? Uh, When you say that for sure, uh, like everything in our band, nothing was planned. Um, You know, I can see how that happened, but really, if, if we were to say that, I suppose Ben Affleck's Daredevil was the, is what eventually <laughs> inspired us to write songs like Paralyzer. Um, I think maybe it opened us, opened us up to, we weren't in a box of what the band was known to do. I, uh, you know, writing for so long on that record and so many different kinds of songs, I think that's when the band um, could visualize our sound just not being one thing, not just being a heavy band, having some different influences, whether it were country stuff, because a couple of the guys were becoming even more fans of country music, um, which they eventually, you know, became Blackie Jacket Jr. So I think, yeah, it was uh, it leading le- from Paralyzer leading up to Paral- Paralyzer, good times leading up to Paralyzer, I think was, you can see the evolution of the band just getting more comfortable trying new things if that makes any sense 
Yeah. So, so good times was a big hit in Canada. I believe it went to number one on, on different rock, uh, rock charts. Um, but it, it wasn't breaking through in the U S and you're signed wow. to wind up, which is a big label in the U S with, with Creed and Evanescence and, and, uh, is it 12 stones and Seether and all these guys, Seether, 12 stones. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, so, there, there starts to be pressure from wind up of, of, okay, big in Canada, but what's going on in the U S. So you right. guys decide to kind of take a gamble, you know, good times is, is probably the best rock song we have, and it's not doing what we want in the U S let's just go all the way to the other end and re- release one thing an acoustic song. If this doesn't work, let's try this. Um, right. And, and everything worked out and we'll talk about that, but was there any fear of releasing an acoustic song as a single for a band that's built this image that's a bit darker and a bit heavier? Well, I guess just another tidbit about Good Times I, I, I got to mention because it all flows into one thing. Good Times was the first um, video that we spent a big budget on. Um, well, Wind Up did that. All of the videos we did on, um, on Tip, which was only three or four videos, they were done for relatively cheap Uh, back then a video a small budget budget video would be like 35 grand and back in the day a big budget would be a million dollars or 700 grand or something which is hilarious because nowadays 35 grand is what most certainly rock bands spend on videos um but you know guns and roses were making three million dollar videos and of course all the like beyonce's or justin timberlake's november rain or something yeah yeah so we'd always, um, you know, I guess, I don't know if we always wanted to do a big budget video, but we just never had the chance. Um, Wind Up, that was the first song that they gave us a huge budget. And we went to that ICE hotel in Quebec. And this, I can't remember the director's name, but he did a couple of corn videos. So it would, we stepped up the video part of the band, um, I think big time on that. And I think we saw the success of that, not so much on radio, but just the the image of the band. If you can, I think if you make the band look bigger than it is in a video, um, I, I think the label got that and they were, they knew that one thing, they believed in one thing, but they thought, you know, having a big budget video along with a song they believed in, they could see how the two work together. Um, so we were lucky enough to make a really big, even more big budget video with one thing, but that song when we, well, I didn't write it. James and Scott, I think went on a camping trip and came back and showed us that song. But when we all heard it, it was like, we all knew that was going to be a hit. It reminded me of a Peter Gabriel song. It was very Peter Gabriel-esque to me. Um, I can't remember what song, if it was like Salisbury Hill or something, but <clears throat> I, I immediately thought, yeah, that's, that's a radio hit for sure. But th- that was all Scott and uh and jay's song so yeah um almost just like paralyzed you know when i first heard scott sing that chorus i I knew i called rob lanny our manager and told him and he remembers this too you know i think we just had like a verse and a chorus with scott singing the chorus and i'm like oh my god that's a hit so we felt the same thing with one thing as well so one thing comes out it's your mainstream breakthrough in the U.S. I believe it goes to number 16 on the Billboard Top 100. It's top 10 on three different U.S. charts. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to ask if you could have predicted that that song would resonate with so many people. And, and you just said that you did yeah. think that it had the, the possibility. Uh, and you mentioned that, uh, you know, Scott went away and came back with the song. Mm-hmm. Rick said that that's the first song that didn't feel like it was finger 11. Like it felt like a gift that was given to the band and didn't feel it. it, it, Yeah. It felt like a gift from the gods. Like here, here's your big breakthrough, do what you can with this and not so much like finger 11 trying to make that song. Yeah, sure. I mean, definitely. I, I, to me, you know, those guys going away on a camping trip, there's a different dynamic of Scott and Rick and uh, James together. And there always was that they had a different relationship than the other guys in the band had with one another as songwriters. I think they were the most, um, well, I guess I think they were the best songwriters in the band. So them going off on a camping trip, just specifically to write songs together. um, They came back with uh, 
stay in shadow, uh, like an acoustic version of stay in shadow and one thing. So it, I'd say it was more a gift from Scott and Jay, not from the gods, you know, but it was because they had time to be on their own and not so much be finger 11 guys, just be two best friends around a campfire writing songs. And they came back with that. So it, it definitely was outside the box of finger 11 because it was outside the box of finger 11. So I've listened to the entire Finger 11 discography probably 10 times between these two interviews. And, wow. you know, my whole life I had listened to the albums, but, mm -hmm. you know, listening with studio headphones with a purpose. One yeah. thing that jumps out to me is Sean's bass playing. So across the entire discography, there are so many tasty, memorable bass lines, yeah. stuff that I feel might get lost if you're not wearing good headphones and really paying attention. Right. Uh, I wanted to ask if I, I feel like his bass playing is like tragically underrated. So I was wondering if yeah. you feel the same and if you have any comments about what it was like being the rhythm section with him holding down the fort for finger 11. Sure. Definitely the best bass player I've ever played with. And I haven't played with many, but one of the best play, best play, bass players of any band I've toured with, um, so underrated. And, you know, and his personality is he's a quiet, you know, he's a quiet soul. He's a gentle soul, um, but he cares about the bass so much, you know, and he spent more time with headphones on, on the bus, you know, always practicing. If, if we had hotel rooms, he would always take his bass and he would just he loved playing bass. Um, and when we were recording stuff, he was always probably the most open to just wanting to create whatever the coolest part was. So like other, you know, like the drums and the guitar, we kind of went into the studio often with a, you know, kind of knew what was going to happen. There was always bass lines on the demo, but when we were recording the record, Sean and, you know, not so much me, James and Rick and, and the producer, Johnny sat in a circle and each bar, each, you know, a verse of the song, they really listened. And like, they were all sitting around going, try this, Sean, try this, Sean, try that. And, and it was a really open, beautiful thing. It wasn't them telling Sean to try things. He was also contributing, but the band just spent a bunch of time, like trying as many different things as they could with the bass um, on every record, you know? And, and because of that, they're, I think the most interesting instrument on all of the records um, maybe not so much grace, the blue skies, but all the rest, um, is the bass. Um, like you said, there's, I find you never know what's around the corner with the bass parts uh, on all those songs. And there's not a lot of things repeated but in a really tasteful way. And that's because, like I said, they sat and really spent time trying to make signature, um, parts that I guess weren't that common with usual rhythm parts. You know, a lot of bands, rock bands were chugging along eighth notes when Sean was doing really melodic stuff there's some know, like jazzy bass. bluesy stuff yeah, in there yeah like i'm thinking i think uh drag you down there's the don't 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 yes. there's like this walking of the bass in this super yeah. heavy song yeah absolutely and, and you know me and him as a rhythm section i i always grew up i, I was mentioning queens earlier when i first discovered rhythm section to me that meant the bass guitar and the bass drum locking in doing the same patterns I, that's not always the case, but that was always something I, I really liked and wanted to have. And me and Sean definitely got to the place where we, you know, when we were writing a song, we were just communicating through our instruments and we locked in on a lot of stuff. Um, I think to make the song better, but kind of cooler too. And, you know, if you listen to a lot of the bass drum, drum parts and the bass guitar, they're, they're playing a lot of cool syncopated stuff together. And that's by Sean listening to the drums and, and really connecting with it. He's, he's a monster bass player. And honestly, the personality that he has is, um, you know, his quiet nature and stuff for some reason, I think helped his instruments, like his whole personality when in a conversation with people who don't know, sometimes, you know, for lack of a better word, awkward, but it, like I say that in the most loving way, but um, you know, just more of a quiet guy, but, all of his personality came out in his bass playing. That's where he spoke. And, um, you know, damn, I miss that guy. I love that guy. 
Yeah, it sounds like maybe his best form of communication was through his bass playing. Like that's where he was free, you know. Um, yeah. there, man, there's so many parts in Finger Eleven songs, or there's so many songs where it's basically just drums and bass, and then there's kind of little guitars or little atmospheric things. But it's it's the drums and bass that are locked in setting yeah. kind of what the song is. So a lot in verses like that. So it's that with, yeah. you know, Scott's vocals that come in and his vocals have a ton of room because there's the guitars aren't really in yet. Anyways, I'm just right. throwing out I, stuff. I, I got to say, man, that I haven't thought about this till right now. I have not thought this in depth about the guys in the band in finger 11 or our parts of these songs I, really in years. So it's like emotional right now in, in the most beautiful of ways to, to like be thinking about those guys. And like, so, you know, I miss those guys. You know, I love them so much. They're my brothers. We were a band for 20 years and yeah, it's, it's very emotional talking about this stuff, man. You know, cause when, when you're not in a band anymore, just, you know, often you just don't talk anymore, you know, and we kind of ended, I know you want to talk about that stuff later, but um yeah it's just it's nice to be talking about those guys and it just reminds me how much i love them yeah when when something beautiful or meaningful like a a a successful band and and years and a relationship when those things end it it's always difficult and and there can be tension there can be hard feelings and and sometimes it takes a lot of years to to, to mature, to, to sure. have more life experiences, to become yeah. a better person. And then you can look back where you don't have so much emotional attachment to it. And you right. can see it from, you know, from a different view and realize yes. that, you know, maybe things happen for a reason, maybe it's yep. for the best or maybe not, but, um, but you can kind of look back and, and hold on to the best parts of what that was. Uh, absolutely. That's, that's what I'm, uh, perfectly said that's what i'm conveying to you i'm i'm having so many beautiful memories right now of it all so with finger 11 man you guys toured so much you guys were road warriors you played with all these Mm. all-time great bands who was the band that you were the biggest fan of before sharing the stage with them um hmm well i mean ozzy i suppose although i i I love Ozzy, but he wasn't like I grew up having all of Ozzy's records. He was probably the most famous character that that we played with, you know, the most recognizable face. Um, Gosh, who else? Um, You know, we would do or or Evanescence or that was was Molly Cruz with St. Asonia. Um, Okay. Evanescence, you know, uh, we spent a lot of time touring with them all around the world, but when they were starting, they were just another band on windup that, you know, had their first big hit. So it wasn't, it wasn't that sort of relationship where we were fans from afar for a long time. And Amy is like a little sister to me. Um, I, I love that girl. Uh, she is just world-class person. And, um, you know, we became great friends in all of our travels and yeah, w- which I did with a lot of people, but a- Amy in particular is the, you know, the sweetest girl and, and such a ferocious singer but yeah probably to answer your question ozzy i suppose was the most you know iconic person to uh to be on the road with on on tour is there such thing as a drum riser that's too high does that exist (laughs) oh man your your shrine up on the throne it's it's funny because there was a few things you know probably more than a few things that you know, a few of the guys in Finger Eleven and me disagreed on. I guess I was more of an 80s guy that I always loved the big drum riser. I always had a dream of having a drum riser with like round stairs going up to it. Um, there's a drum riser in the video for Hire by Creed that was always like, that's the one. It's red and, and it's stairs going up to like, you know. So I always envisioned myself having that, but we never had that. We had a, a normal little rinky dink riser. And I think eventually we got a front part to make it look round. I know those guys are still using to this day when I see videos of them, but you know, I recently I watched Megadeth and their fucking drum riser is ridiculously high, almost to a comical level of height. That's probably too much, but I like a drum, a drummer being on a riser and, if the riser looks cool and is part of the stage set to me, 
that's cool. But I've always been a fan of production on stage, you know, big light shows. I know back in the day, me and Rick would disagree on, you know, he, he liked park hands, like eighties park hand lights. And he would have loved to have a, our show just to be that, you know, a bunch of park hands on. And I was the opposite, you know, those moving lights and all those stuff. I was always a fan of those, of that look on the stage. So we disagreed on that. But uh, yeah, I'm an 80s guy. The bigger the production, including the drum riser for me, the better. But when I started playing with St. Nasonia, we had Stain's gear. So Stain had this huge drum riser. So the first show I played with them at Rock on the Range, you know, it was a bigger drum riser than I'd ever had. I was like, yes, finally. <laughs> so I was at the Megadeth concert on Tuesday in Montreal. You oh, and yeah, I were right. texting from there. Yeah. And before Megadeth went on, you're like, make sure to check out the drum riser, like be aware of how high that drum riser is. And yeah. uh, I was, I was texting you about how insane the mosh pits were for trivium and for lamb of God. And you were saying that, uh, you know, the guys in lamb of God and I'm texting you, they're on stage, they get off stage, they start texting you. So it was this whole Randy, kind of circle yeah. of texting uh, on that yeah. night, which was cool. And man, I, I got an incredible video of the trivium mosh pit and it was mm. so good and so wild that their singer reached out to me he he slid into my dms and said dude you got to send me this video and then Amazing. trivium the singer posted the video uh one of the other band members posted it so i have like a oh, cool. from that concert i have like a viral video of their mosh pit it was it was Amazing. bananas like it was dangerous like i was watching yeah, yeah. it from a safe distance but uh, I mean, you sent me that video as it was happening. Yeah, that was that was cool. Man, those guys are crazy. Uh, what would you say are the actually before I ask that question, when you think of drum risers, is the is the kind of all time great drum riser Tommy Lee of Motley Crue in like the one that goes out and can spin all the way upside down? Oh, man, well, it's tough with him because it just kept um evolving you know when you look back at that um girls 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 video where they they showcase that it actually looks really kind of clunky and very 80s now um you know as time went on obviously leading up to the the uh roller coaster that i was on tour with molly for that i got to experience that close up every night but you know there's really it's such a difference it's just the i guess the what's the word like the technology from that eighties drum riser from the girls, girls, girls tour till now. So that's probably the most iconic, but I don't know the crucify as they call it is probably now. I mean, I'm not sure how you top that. Those guys are doing this summer tour or stadium tour coming up. And I got to think that they're going to top that roller coaster with something, but what <laughs> I can't wait to find out. It's, it's never enough. What, what's the best concert you've ever seen so it doesn't have to be mm. someone that you you played with but just the best concert you've ever seen i think um as far as being part of something like in this moment with something uh cold play at um the air canada center there's something about maybe where i was sitting how they used the building you know the lights in an arena that has promotion stuff going around the arena they used that as part of their light show which i'd never seen a band do and they had lights, not just on the stage, but at different areas of the crowd throughout the arena. So I, I was seeing something that I'd not seen before and just the nature of Coldplay and their songs and the way the singer, um, Chris Martin, is that his name? Yeah. The way that he, the way that he uh, brings the crowd into their show. I just, for some reason that night I saw them, I was immersed. I felt like I was part of the show. So that one really sticks out to me as one of the best, you know, for sure. Coldplay is probably the only one of my favorite bands that I've yet to see live. So I think you just planted oh, the yeah. seed that like the next time yeah. they're in Ottawa, Montreal or Toronto, yeah. I, I got to go. Another great live band sent in a quote here. So this is, man, yeah. these are all drummers. I mean, the drum wow. world, the drum world has, has shown up on your behalf. This is from wow. Jeff Burroughs, the drummer for the tea party. 
So yeah. he has to say the following things about Rich. He says, Rich is the kind of drummer that uses an unconventional approach to the method of his creations. He'll take a standard song and flip it so that it makes things not only more interesting for himself, but takes the audience on a different journey than a standard four on the floor drummer. Always an outstanding performer. Jeff Burroughs, The Tea Party. Wow. You know what? Um, amazing. Amazing, amazing. Jeff is, and I've told him this many times, one of my all-time favorite drummers. When I was younger, I saw the Tea Party so many times, and the drum part on Save Me is still one of my favorite uh, you know, song, drum songs of all time, of all time. And Jeff is one of my favorite drummers of all time. And uh, growing up and watching them and then eventually playing with them. And then after that, eventually getting to know them, especially Jeff. Um, I consider him a dear friend now. He's also probably the, I'm the biggest fanboy, but also a friend with, you know? So I just, I, you know, I bow to Jeff Burroughs. I think he's a monster and such a great guy. And that, that's beautiful to hear that, man. I when believe when, when I ask mutual friends that know Jeff Burroughs, they all say that he is a, like a monster drummer, like more so than than we know. Like if you've never seen him live, um, yeah. that you wouldn't understand just how great he is on the drums. He is so awesome. And I remember back in the day, it's like some shows I would see and he'd wear a bandana. And when when I go watch him, he was wearing that bandana. It was like, oh, shit. Jeff's going for it tonight. I mean, I felt so involved in his playing that I even noticed if he was wearing a bandana or not that night, you know, but yeah, save me to this day is a song that I cannot play um, properly. And, and he wrote that, you know, that's, I mean, th that will live on for, you know, for all time. The save me drum part is just like, I bow to Jeff. Love him. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's one thing to, be able to play something but then it's also something else being the creator of that thing that's right. hard to play right sure. so in in 2007 you guys released them versus you versus me i'm just gonna read a few of of the accolades what happened after that came out so this is now your first multi-platinum album in canada your second gold album in the U.S. There's four singles, Paralyzer, Falling On, I'll Keep Your Memory Vague, Talking to the Walls, three more Juno nominations, Group of the Year, Single of the Year, Rock Album of the Year, and the band on its seventh Juno nomination wins its first Juno. So seventh time is a charm. What does wow. that Juno award win mean to you? So you have a Juno. What, is, what does mm. that mean to you? And, and do you have that Juno somewhere? Yes, I have it right. Not in the other room, in my living room downstairs. Um, it, well, the first observation I have when you're reading throughout all the records, I have no idea, you know, the, the, where songs charted and stuff. When you say it back, it's it's incredible, you know, because I, I don't really know any of that. And even if I knew it, I don't remember that. So it, the band sounds, you know, bigger than I remember it when, you, when you're telling me these stats. But uh Finally winning a Juno. I don't even think I knew that we were nominated seven times, to be honest. Um, so I think there was one nomination uh, before you were a part. I, so, sorry, there was a Rainbow Butt Monkeys nomination. I think it was more okay. like Best New Group. Then there was okay. maybe one for Tip before you were in the band. And then you were, you were a part of maybe three or four of them. There might have been the yeah, album after you or right. something so yeah. there there might be three gotcha. or four for you specifically that sounds about right yeah but yeah you know not only winning one but i think we were lucky enough to play the junos twice and one of the time when one thing came out we did a medley with us our lady p oh, sorry, our lady peace billy talent three days grace and simple plan we all played like 30 seconds of each of our songs um that was such a cool memory that we got to do that. And then the second time that we played, we had like an orchestra and we played Paralyzer with a, I think it was like a youth orchestra. So man, you know, and, and the parties at the Junos were always super memorable. And we all, you know, so many fun, well, somewhat fun, somewhat, I don't remember all of them, but just hanging out with different characters and cause you know, actors and stuff would go to the Junos as well. Same with the much music video awards. They're, there was always like, not just musicians, there was other, you know, characters there that made for some fun memories. But 
yeah, winning a Juno was, I, I guess we just really felt like we were part of the Canadian music industry um, for good. You know, we always, I guess, somewhat felt on the outside, but I guess, yeah, the name became more like a household name at that time. And I started noticing it too. Like we won the Juno and then, you know, my parents started introducing me, all the neighbors started knowing who I was in the band. So <laughs> it was that, it was that time when it got really big, you know, and it was all very noticeable, but I got that Juno downstairs and it's, it's sitting there. I'm very proud of it. You know, you're famous when your, your elderly neighbors finally start to know who you are. Yeah. And, and, you know, your parents will always do that. You know, they still do to this day. You got to meet, you know, you got to come meet Anne. She's coming over today to say hi. And you're like, oh, mom, I'm just here for dinner. You know, and a bunch of awkward people come in. And but that's awesome. You know, parents will always do that. Embarrass you in all the greatest of ways. What What's funny is a lot of, you know, as I talk to all these amazing musicians, what, what's funny is a lot of those musicians say their parents never took their career seriously until they won a Ju had say a, a Juno nomination or a Grammy nomination that, you know, the industry itself acknowledging right. is what yeah. took the parents to start taking the kids seriously with what they did. So maybe that was yeah, what it was with the Juno for you. I, I can see that for sure. I don't remember when the moment was, but probably when I was able to not mooch money off them anymore too. <laughs> Cause for many years I, I did. That's a memorable moment for your parents where you stop asking for money. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so you were, you were just kind of blown away by all the, the charting and the, the stats mm -hmm. and everything with finger 11, cause it's been a while yeah. or maybe you weren't aware as it happened. So I'm going to hit you with the greatest stats of all. So paralyzer okay. comes out, uh, mm -hmm. It's the first single, becomes a massive global hit. It goes to number one in Canada and the US. On the alternative alternative charts in the US, it tied the record for most weeks spent on the chart at 52 weeks. So you were tied with uh, two other bands. Since then, Rise Against with their song Savior has gone on to break the record. But at the time, you had an all-time record charting song for a full wow. year on the charts. Uh, wow. It sold 3.4 million copies just in the U S not globally. And on Spotify, it's now been streamed almost 200 million times. So wow. that's like everyone in Canada, like every single person in Canada has listened to it, you know, two or three or four times. It's, wow. it's insane. So those are some that's crazy. crazy stats about paralyzer. So almost no one in human history will ever create or release or experience a song like paralyzer what right. what does it feel like at the peak of paralyzer it was i guess the way it was written so organically in the moment and because i it seems like a lot of hit songs out there were you know other writers working with it, just very manufactured a lot of um <clears throat> a lot of business put into the song to create a hit Paralyzer was written just with us, the five guys that had been in a band for all these years. And it was just a real natural, organic song that we had written as a band. So to see it grow the way it did, um, it's like we were extra proud of it because a lot of the other bands at the time we saw with hits just felt a little more manufactured. Um, you know, we had created that song from the ground up. And we definitely noticed a big change, a shift in the band's um, notoriety. And um, it's like that song was everywhere and everyone knew it. And it still kind of is, you know, I hear it on the radio here in Michigan pretty often if I'm listening to the radio. So it, and then like I was saying earlier, a lot of the, the TV stuff, um, like the Jay Leno and the, you know, some of the other stuff we did, the international touring became um, more prominent, you know, going over to Europe with Kid Rock and, um, Evanescence taking us Australia. So it's just like everything grew to the next level. And, um, and, and we definitely noticed it and we were able to enjoy it because the, it was such a slow ride for us. So by the time we got to that point in our career, we were taking it all in and, you know, and loving every moment of it for sure. Maybe a little too much on me and a couple of the guys end. we were probably taking it and other things in more than we should have. <laughs> so 
you you mentioned a few minutes ago that the first time you heard Scott singing the verse or the chorus of Paralyzer, you knew there was something special there. But after the surprise yeah. success of one thing in the US, at that point, could you have ever imagined that you would have a single that's bigger than one thing? You know, it was, no, I don't think we could. And because it was a song that just Scott and Jay wrote, I guess the three of us were, we benefited from the success of the song, but in, in other ways we didn't, it was their song. And um, it, with Paralyzer, we, we all felt more part of it, the writing of it. And it was almost like another couple of guys had, had written one thing and given it to us. Or like Rick said, a gift was given to us, um, but it was not a, a unified five guy thing. So Paralyzer was like, I was saying just, it was our baby that, that the whole world was their baby now. So um, I don't know if you could ever think you were going to top one thing, but we definitely didn't want to be a one hit wonder. And that song was, I think I heard it once in an elevator, like a, a music, like dentist version of it, of one thing. And it was kind of like, Oh my God. Or maybe I was in a dentist office. I, he I heard it somewhere where it was like unbelievable that the song had got that big, but also kind of like, shit man i hope we have another song or we yeah, we are literally a one-hit wonder so to have a, another song at radio like yeah we're out of that one-hit wonder world we're a two-hit wonder it's man because i find i find that so funny because you've had like 12 successful singles in canada at this point you know right. so when you guys you know you guys refer to yourself at that point as maybe a one-hit wonder it's like does canada not count like th those songs were huge in canada and, uh, you guys were no, massive you, in canada long before one thing you're right absolutely and, and i guess i guess that just you know it's hard to just have a career and sustain yourself just in in canada you can only really tour canada once maybe twice a year to go across the whole country it takes a couple of weeks and you're and you're you know from one end to the other so it's hard to just stay in Canada and sustain yourself. Um, so you're sort of hoping all the other countries in the world um, get on board because you, you can spend more time doing what you love, touring and, and, and playing shows, but also, you know, you get to see the benefits, you know, you, or you're able to pay your bills finally when the song becomes bigger in other places. And especially in the U S when you get songs on the radio there, um, after being broke for so long, you know, we were lucky enough to actually start seeing some money come in. So I guess that's why I refer those songs, you know, one hit wonder or two hit wonder. I, I do recognize that some of the other songs, how well they did in Canada, but they just, that was when I guess my life changed, meaning I was able to buy my first house and, you know, by, by no means, not even close to made me rich or anything like that, but it just, I finally was able to live, you know, comfortably and, get a house and not worry how much this barbecue costs and go buy it at Canadian tire. And that's the one I want and go get a car, not a fancy car, but just a car. So it was like that moment in my life where I was just able to live without worry, you know, and buy every one of the bar shots all night and, and feel cool, <laughs> which I did many times. It, it, it took like one of the biggest Canadian hit singles of all time to feel cool. But yes. uh, uh, so I've, I've heard that Paralyzer actually comes from like a, a random jam session that wasn't supposed to happen. Is that fact or fiction? And do you remember yep. the first time you heard kind of the iconic guitar riff that everyone knows? Yeah, I we were still writing or rehearsing at the at Scott and Sean's parents house at the time. And a friend of the band, Scott Bowman, I think he was in school for photography. And he was going to come over that day and he wanted to shoot the band rehearsing and stuff. I think, I don't know, for like a school project or something to do with his schooling. And we were leaving that day and that's when he showed up. I don't know if we were early or he was late, but he pulled in the driveway as we were leaving. And he was like, oh, fuck, you guys are going. Um, so we were like, well, let's just go upstairs for a minute and we'll just jam some stuff out for a second. He can get some shots. So we just started playing and literally that bump, 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 and just Sean going bump, bump, bump. It, it just happened right there just because he was just taking some photos. The first thing we literally, the first thing we jammed. And I think we all were kind of like, that's cool. Just repeat that. And we kept just doing that chorus music over and over. And 
I think we were giggling at how, fuck, that was cool, man. Let's record that. So we recorded that day, that moment, that just that chorus thing. And I think sent it to Scott. And not long after, he sent back the vocal, the melody. I'm not paralyzed. And when I heard that, I was saying earlier today, I, I was so sure that that was going to be a huge song as soon as I heard Scott sing that. And I called our manager, Rob, and I told him, man, wait till you hear this. We've got a fucking hit song. And it was immediate, you know, but it, it literally just came out of um, a friend of the band, Scott Bowman's taking a few photos of us. And we just needed to do something while he took some photos. And it, it seems like all, you know, of the most successful songs out there, people always say they wrote in five minutes and it, it's true, man. It's, I don't know why that is, but we spent, weeks and weeks on some songs and just slaved over them um, hoping that they would become maybe a song on the radio and they completely bomb the song that took five minutes out of nowhere, just out of the universe, you know, was the one. So if we could find the secret to that, I guess my name would be Chad Kroger at that point. Cause he knows the secret to it, but I, I do not. Yeah. He's Chad Kroger's figured out the formula to, to write, amazing and catchy yeah. radio I, rock hits over and over i actually again. i text with chad just yesterday and they've got a new record i guess that's i guess that's what i'm talking about he's got a new record coming out though but love chad yeah i i've heard that once you guys got huge with paralyzer that chad kroger is one of the first people that told the band um you know at this level you're about to get some haters and, you know, he knows more than anybody. And wow. I, I guess that's true. So he, I guess he had a warning for, for finger 11 saying, Hey, that single's huge. And I'm just letting you know, someone that's already here and experienced this, you're about to get some haters, which is oh. the true metric of sure. having, sure. Having made it, you know, I, I don't, I, maybe he's like told the other guys, I don't remember that conversation, but um, yeah, he would be the guy that knows that. It's funny, in some ways, I've become closer with him and a lot of other people after my Finger 11 years, I, I developed some different bonds with guys that I met back then, but for a variety of reasons now, I have a much different, um, closer relationship to Chad and some other guys after that, you know, for whatever reason, and maybe just because the way I've grown or the way I communicate now versus then, I just seem to, you know, I'm closer to him these days than ever before. And I've known, we've known those guys for, you know, 20 odd year, years. So. so I, I saw Nickelback so long ago that this was in about the year 2000, they were opening for Everclear. That's how long ago I saw Nickelback. Amazing. Yeah. This sounds that funny was during, I, during the state. I think they were starting yeah. to get big in Canada with the state, but it was Right. prior to how you remind me and, and silver side. Oh, wow. And art is a really good friend of mine as well from Everclear. He's a dear friend of mine. I love that guy. So that's cool, man. That was probably when um, Everclear had um, the Santa Monica was going on back then. That's all. It was, was just after there. that. So the next album with uh, father of mine and everything oh, yeah. to everyone. And, and yeah, yeah. I will buy you a new life or whatever the singles were on that album. Oh uh, Yeah. Art's a great human being, man. Such a good dude. So with Paralyzer, kind of wrapping up, I know we've been diving into Paralyzer a lot here. What, what I think is one of the things that makes Paralyzer undeniable and catchy is, is actually your drum playing. So there's that catchy little intro to the song on drums. There's the catchy drums kind of dance groove in, in the verse. Mm -hmm. There's kind of the aggressive pre-chorus drums mm -hmm. and yeah. uh and the breakdown so it's like you're all over that song with with memorable drum parts do, do you remember Thanks. coming up with with what you're going to play on the drums for that song well like i was saying i think that first initial jam um i guess that was the chorus part so it was that's just a big open hi-hat rock beat there um as we started writing the verse um it's more close to God, that dance beat that you're talking about. I don't really remember specifically coming up with that. I, I think the intro, which is probably the most iconic part of that song. Doots, doots. I, I, we did that later in the studio and I'm, I can't quite remember how that came to be. Um, I know the verse is sort of that. So, 
you know, we might've just tried that and was like, just let's do the drums on their own there. But uh, yeah, I can't really remember how, you know, the whole process of creating the drum parts on that song, but it was all about upbeat dancing, you know, make people move. That was, that was the whole theme of the song. So I was trying to stick with that theme. Create I, that, I, I found that, so, you know, the kind of heavier part leading into the chorus, that part, I always found it funny that, so the song is kind of dancey dance rock, but I found that that little part, <clears throat> the, my the face or course. your face, whatever that part, yeah, that it's like, that was a little glimpse into the old, like grace of blue skies, um, <laughs> finger 11, where there's just this like angst for like a moment. I'm like, that's right. the old band right there. And then you oh, hit wow, the big chorus. Cool. And I'm like, and there's the new band right there. It's funny. Um, we met with one producer and I remember specifically that part, the pre-course was the one part he didn't like and wanted to change. And had we have worked with him, that part wouldn't have been in there. And I think that was Bob Ezrin. We, we met dinner, had to have dinner with him. And I do remember him specifically that whole thing you're talking about. That's pretty heavy. Like that, that's, yeah. that really he, jumps out. He might not have thought that fitted the song. And I guess, you know, like you're saying it, it maybe is, unique to the rest of the song but um yeah that, that's a cool part and then the bridge of the song has a that little section before the bridge really starts is like that part too it's a it's kind of a, a unique drum part um a, a friend of mine that's a, a a drum instructor in toronto named jeff salem i was going back with him a few years ago to to take some lessons and he was so intrigued with that drum beat at the bridge of paralyzer um you know he asked me to teach it to him and he wrote it out on a chart and then another drum teacher came in as i was there he was like hey you know that part on paralyzer check it out and i had no idea that it was a sort of a complex little part because the rest of the song is just a big dance thing but um yeah there's a moment in there that was created naturally that i guess some drummers sort of you know gravitated to for some reason so bob ezrin that's another um mega producer right didn't he do like yeah. pink the floyd's the wall yeah yeah, yeah. that's yeah. man it's so crazy it's so crazy like after talking to david bottrell and and seeing human beings that have made that many iconic albums it's like yeah. it's hard to believe that these people are human but uh yeah. any, anyways my last yeah. question about paralyzer is okay. um it seems like every few snare hits mm -hmm. there's a sound like a reverse snare is is there yeah. a reverse snare in there or an effect or something what's going yeah. on there's actually this will help three... me sleep at night after all these years of no, you're right. You got it. There, are. there are three different snare drums in Paralyzer. Um, th there is a reverse snare. Um, there is a sampled snare, like an electronic snare. And then there's the, the real snare. So throughout the song, um, yeah, you're hearing three different snare sounds, but that, that, uh, reversed one, I, I think creates a bit of the groove in the verse for sure. And, and like James's background vocal part in that verse is so hidden in the track, but that really, uh, I think, adds a unique dimension to the song as well. You know what's better than one awesome snare? Three awesome snares. Yes, of course. <laughs> There's never too many snares. Uh, so, so Change the World, as we wrap up with this album, Change the World is one mm. of my favorite Finger Eleven songs. Was it, was it ever in consideration to maybe be a single i just need to know this it was i i, I was so sure that it was gonna be i can't remember how it was decided it was not gonna be but um you know i would have chose that over talking to the walls for sure um yeah i don't know that i think they're taught um i'll keep your memories vague i think there was a you know a decision between that and change the world and we went with that one but that is one of my favorite songs we ever wrote as well yeah actually when you bring that up that that's a good point that sonically i'll keep your memory vague and mm -hmm. and change the world they're similar enough that maybe you yeah. wouldn't want them back to back as singles so right. you made a choice and uh i'll keep your memory vague is one of my favorites from that album so you you probably someone knows what they're doing here and yeah. it's not and it's not me um no, me neither so i have one final story from okay. around the time of that album and then i have uh, a quote for you and then we'll move on uh and okay. we'll quickly go over your last album life turns electric with the band so okay. sure. on march 8th of 2008 so this is within this album's 
touring circuit. Uh, I do a road trip with some friends from Ottawa to Toronto to see your show at Massey Hall. So okay. this is this is supposed to be a, a, a breezy four hour drive. And it mm. ends up being one of the most it, it was an all time record um, snowstorm yeah. for, in March. And it took us 12 hours. There's there is cars in the ditch, roads blocked. We're barely moving. 12 hours later, wow. we finally make it to Massey Hall. Mm -hmm. And at the time, Finger Eleven and Chevelle are my two favorite bands. Mm -hmm. And it, you're a double bill. We get there and Chevelle is not playing. Uh, yeah. They probably got stuck in the same snowstorm. I am absolutely heartbroken. I adore Chevelle. Yeah, so this is too. this is turning into like the worst day ever. And wow. we we get to the show. We're on the floor. We have great tickets and we see a mini drum kit. And I'm thinking, wait, is there another band opening? Because Finger Eleven, they have this monster drum kit and uh, this big, you know, this drummer that's going to beat the shit out of these drums. And, <laughs> and it turns out you guys went above and beyond above and beyond the call of duty. And it was finger 11 acoustic opening mm. up for finger 11 electric. Right. And you guys gave it everything you've got for the people that did the, the, tr you know, trudge yeah. through the snowstorm. And it ended up being an incredible concert. And, uh, I guess that's just a story I want to share with you. And I wanted to thank you yeah. for your rock and roll heroics that day, um, <laughs> sa saving that day from, from tragedy. Well, awesome, man. I know. I remember being bummed at Chevelle. Um, I think they weren't getting across the board. It was, it was weather related, but it was them crossing the border too. And we had spent a ton of time um, doing a co-headline tour with them in the States. Um, but yeah, that half acoustic, half heavy thing. Um, that was really cool, man. I, I just, I love the concept of that. And I think I came out in like a suit first um, and played and then, came, you know, the, the rock section after, but yeah, that was one of those ideas that not all of them always panned out and not always, uh, they don't, they didn't always come out like we thought they would, but that one was a, a very cool idea. And Matt, to play Massey Hall, it was, we were bummed because that was such an iconic place to finally play. And I think it was only half full because of the blizzard. So, so I have a, a quote from another drummer. Uh, oh, man. I, I'm probably going to butcher his last name. So I apologize in advance. This is Tony Rabaleo, the drummer from Joy Drop. Yeah. Tony. Um, so he says, I remember meeting Rich back in the late 90s. Joy Drop and Finger Eleven used to be on the same festival shows at times. Mm -hmm. And we later had the same management. It always mm -hmm. struck me that that he's such a cool, humble guy, chilling and and talking backstage. Then you'd see him on the kit later, and he's a fucking beast. Uh, Finger Eleven always tore it up and left no prisoners. It's been a long yeah. time, Rich. I hope all is well. So that's Tony oh, from man. Joy Drop. Love Tony, man. Great drummer and a yeah, great human. I haven't I haven't heard his name in a long time, and it's great. I'm gonna reach out to him after hearing that. Um, Joy Drop were an awesome band. Um, you know, Tara's still a great friend. Um, she's gone on to do so well with a. The she's TV the face stuff. of of hockey in Canada. Yeah, she sure is, and yeah, they were a great band. Um, I think they recently came back, or not recently, a few years ago. They did some shows, but uh, I would definitely uh, throughout the year see Tony around. Um, when I moved to Toronto as well, I saw him. And yeah, he's such a sweet dude, man. So I've definitely I got to reach out and say hello to him. I can't believe all these quotes. I'm just I'm humbled and blown away by it i did not expect that yeah i you know I, i've heard that pe people will forget what you say but they'll always remember how you make them feel so my goal with the wow. podcast is is number one to to share the story of of these remarkable individuals to take a deep dive into what makes them great, how, how they've achieved mastery so that we can learn from, you know, your habits and, and your beliefs and your work ethic and all those things. And, um, and, and to get you in the field so that this is, is a memorable interview amongst many it, it, interviews, you know, it very much is man. So I have, um, let's see here. Okay. So we're, Actually, I was going to mention with Tony that uh, I, I lived in Mississauga for 11 years. So I'm originally from Ottawa. I moved back in the last year. But when I was in Mississauga, uh, 
I used to go to his open mic. So he has this legendary open mic at the supermarket in Toronto. And I think it's called free fall Sundays. And it's like the longest running open mic in like oh, Toronto wow. history or something crazy. And he still does it. Like it just opened up again after the, uh, the lockdowns ended. Um, oh, so wow. that's, that's how I know Tony is he's given a platform. He's given a stage to local talent cool. for years. And I've seen like Justin Ozuka there. I know you have a history with Justin Ozuka, I believe, but I've mm-hmm. seen like world-class musicians just show up and sign up to play on stage. So, Oh, wow. That's, I didn't know about that. How cool. Yeah. So uh, let's dive into life. Life turns electric. So this is your last album with finger 11. This is in 2010 Um, living in a dream and whatever doesn't kill me. Those were the singles nominated for the band's eighth Junie Junie Juno award. That's for rock album of the year. And despite the singles, despite the Juno nominations for you, um, you, you were not a huge fan of this album and talking mm-hmm. with Rick, he wasn't a huge fan of this album. So why is it that this isn't one of the band's favorite albums? Well, well, for living in a dream is one of, you know, my favorite songs we ever wrote and the production on it is, I think my favorite song of how it sounds because it's a like Chris Lord algae or, I can't remember who were, whoever mixed that song didn't mix the rest of the record. I think it was Chris Lord Algy, but possibly I'm usually him or like Andy Wallace. Like those are like, Oh, you know, I think it was Andy Wallace. I think it was Andy Wallace. That was just a guess, but I just named the two biggest uh, mixing guys. Period. Yes. It was Andy Wallace and he was about to do the Jane's addiction record. So he could only commit to living in a dream. Uh, So a couple of things about that record. We, we really tried, you know, I guess we, we gave into the idea that we need to follow up paralyzer with something um, not, not so much similar, but just that would be for, for people that just discovered finger 11 through paralyzer, we wanted to be able to keep them interested. Um, We had an A&R guy at wind up that sort of sold us on that idea to not, to not run from that concept, you know, to look this, kind of song got you guys where you are we don't have to recreate the song but let's just you know keep within that vein and try something similar at least for one song so we did that on living in a living in a dream and it really backfired on us because when we presented it to radio stations their reaction was uh kind of sounds like paralyzer and we were like fuck that's what that's kind of what we were trying to do and it just totally reversed on us and uh and was not at American radio that I think it was the number one song in Canada. Um, I think might be wrong on that, but the, with the way the album was done in New York, uh, I think it just lacked any direction. We were, we were at a, a little studio in New York with no real producer, um, with, with no producer. It was a lot of like late night. I think we spent a, f- a few of us anyway, you know, up till four in the morning, drinking every night excessively. Um, it just was unfocused. I got married at the time. I took, went to Hawaii and got married. It just, you know, like we weren't as driven and focused as we have been in the past. It felt really thrown together to me. And yeah, and we were just, I don't know, we we're a bunch of, at least three of us were just hungover guys all the time. And we felt like we were going to almost just demo ideas. It didn't feel like we were making a record. It felt like we were just working on some ideas with, with no producer, with no real connection to the studio. There were some other bands coming in and out of the studio while we were there in the other room. I remember the guys in 12 stones were there and it just was like, I don't know. It was just a strange time. Um, and then all of a sudden the album was done and, um, you know, I, James and Rick were credited with producing the record. Um, you know, I'm not sure I would agree with that, but it's it's great that they you know were able to get that recognition. But it, to me, there was no producer on that record at all. And that that was the first record we did without someone from the outside being a voice or at least another opinion to the band. And just there wasn't great songs. You know, we didn't have, we only had a few songs. The other songs, we just kind of tried to finish, in my opinion. How do we get, okay, we got a verse, a bit of a chorus. Let's, how do we just get through these three minutes and, and there's another song? There's a bunch of those. There's another song on that. You um, said there was about three songs that you really liked and that you were proud of. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I've gone back recently. I think gather and give when I went back and listened to it, it's like, wait a second. That was on that record. Was it? Gather, no, that was on them versus you versus me. Scratch that. Um, yeah, I guess living in a dream and uh, whatever doesn't kill me. I don't remember even all the songs on that record. I have to, it's funny how that happens, man. Time goes. It's all a blur. Yeah. Well, I just don't look at our records or the track listing or anything for years, you know? So maybe that's a good thing. I'm not sure, but I guess that's my description of why I don't think it's a great record. And I understand why it didn't do that well. And I think at that time, personally, my relationship with a few of the guys were starting to change, which, you know, obviously led to where it was, where it led to. And yeah, we, I, I don't think we were the band that we were. Maybe the success of Paralyzer threw us off um, because of all those years of not having that lifestyle. It's, you know, our lives changed for Paralyzer, mostly for the better, but maybe as a band and as a group of guys, as songwriters, maybe not so much. I'm not sure. So we're going to dive into Saint Asanya. Um, I just have one question before that. For We have a lot of musician listeners. Um, for for some some newer drummers, so either some young kids that are just starting to drum or some drummers that are teenagers that are starting to consider doing this as a, as a living, as a career, do you have any advice to young drummers? And, yeah. and do you do you have what would be the best way for a a new drummer to make a name for themselves um i think i think really learning to be a drummer for to service a song not to be a drummer um i think the quicker that you can get your head around not overplaying i guess realizing what a structure of a song is you know what what a bridge i didn't know what a bridge was until years later getting a verse pre-chorus chorus verse pre-chorus chorus bridge just understanding uh, a song so you know a, a drummer can be a songwriter as well and certainly a, a if not writing the song can really participate and elevate the song so understanding the structure of a song not just your drumming uh, um, i think it's important and then when you are playing a song or writing a song um, just really focusing on servicing the song not your drums um, you want to make the drum parts only they're only as good as if they're helping elevate the chorus and the vocals and the big picture of the song, in my opinion, unless you're in a band that are, you know, a band like dream theater or tool or something where that's part of it for, you know, a rock band, nobody, most of the, most people in the world don't give a fuck about what the drums are doing. It's just background. And if they can bob their head to it, the drums have serviced the song. So I think be a drummer that knows that and just be an asset to the song, not a distraction to the song, I suppose I would say. So you mentioned that you, you love Metallica, big fan of Metallica. So I have a quote from someone that's worked with Metallica. So this is Mike Frazier. This guy recorded and mixed six ACDC records. He's also worked with Metallica, Aerosmith, and Rush. So uh, this is short but powerful. So Mike Frazier says, Rich is one of Canada's best kick-ass drummers. So Mike Frazier, short and sweet. Jeez, jeez. Yeah, I, the, these quotes will, I mean, after this interview, I'm going to have to just sat, sit and uh, meditate on all this it, with uh, some humble gratitude because that's it's amazing. We should, we should make a, a edited compilation video of just the quotes. Uh, and if ever that. you're, you're feeling down and out, you can throw on that video and it'll be your, uh, your pick me back up. I would love that. So in 2013, you leave finger 11, you go on to start super group Saint Asanya with uh, Adam Gonche from, from three days grace. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how did you first meet Adam? How did this come to come to fruition? Um, well, I guess I'll correct you on one thing. It's pronounced Asonia, Saint Asonia. Asonia. Yeah, just just so you know, doesn't matter. Um, I knew Adam just like I we knew Neil. Um, we knew Three Days Grace um, since they were seventeen years old. I mean, obviously Neil, that story of auditioning, but um, from the very beginning, we knew them and played festivals with them. And uh, you know, Adam was, I suppose, always an acquaintance, like all those guys were. Um, when I moved into up to Toronto, 
I remember hearing that Adam, it seemed almost like out of the blue had quit three days grace. Um, I remember like with a letter, like they were just given a letter that he was done. And it was big news when it happened. Um, and our guitar tech, Alan, that uh, unfortunately passed away, um, he had like played some drums with Adam up in Peterborough, like doing side project stuff. And uh, I think he, he was the one that told me, yeah, Adam's not in the band. He's doing, he's, you know, he's doing some solo stuff. And he gave me Adam's number. So originally I just texted him asking if kind of, if he was okay, you know, like, Hey dude, I heard you left Ben. Cause you know, from a distance, what I saw was they were at the peak of their success. And all of a sudden Adam, Adam immediately left. So um, I was just kind of curious if he was all right, you know, there's some buddy. red flags there for sure that something yeah. might not be right. So um, he got back to me and um, I can't remember exactly what was said, but at the same time, whatever was going on um, in the finger 11 camp with me wasn't the best. So um, I think we talked about, I said, Hey, if you ever, I know you're doing some solo stuff. If you ever need a drummer, man. And he was like, oh, dude, I might take you up on that. And like the next day he called me and said, I got some solo st shows coming up. You know, would you want to play them with me? So that's how I first started um, getting Adam back into my life and then playing shows. It was just Adam Gontier. Um, and he was doing some shows around the state. So I, I, the first show I think was in New Mexico. I played, we flew to like Calgary or somewhere with finger 11. I did a show. And then that, that night flew to New Mexico to do a show with Adam. So you know, for a while there, I was doing both and it was just a side project or really not even a side project. It was just Adam doing his thing and I was just drumming with him. But while that was happening, me and him, we were also having to be neighbors. I found out I, I was saying I just moved into the city and we were like, I, I was in Liberty Village and he was, we could literally see each other's windows from my living room. I could see his building. And I remember going, Adam, turn your lights on. And he was flicking them. He was like, oh my God, dude, I see your place from here. So we were just, um, started developing a different kind of friendship than we had in the past and hanging out a lot more. And he was, you know, putting a new project together and it, the more time we spent together and the, how things were getting kind of bad with um, my relationship with a couple of guys in, in finger 11, I was just starting to lean towards the idea of maybe doing something more permanently with him. And we started talking about that. Um, so yeah, that was sort of how the, the, the shift began of me getting back in touch with him. You know, that's kind of the story with that. So when I was 17, my parents drove me from Ottawa to Toronto for Canadian Music Week. And I caught Mudvayne at Cool House in Toronto. And out of nowhere, this young trio band opens up. They look like teenagers. And it was three days grace before anyone knew who they were. And wow. I thought they were awesome. And then a few months later, I Hate Everything About You blows up at radio and they're one of the biggest bands uh, in the world. So that's, you know, me discovering wow. the band before everyone discovered Mud them. That, that, that's a hard band to open for, damn. You know what? You know what's tough is bands like Mudvayne or Tool or whoever, like their, their fan bases are so diehard that mm -hmm. opening bands get booed, like no matter how yeah. good they are. So I remember yep. Three Days Grace being awesome yeah. and they, they were getting booed pretty hard, like not sure. responding, not showing it, just doing their things, like paying their dues. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, that was a tough gig, just like you mentioned. I bet. Yeah. So um, I heard that you helped come up with the band name that I mispronounced, Asonia. <laughs> Asonia? Asonia. Yeah. Saint Asonia. Saint Asonia. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we had already began, or maybe we had finished recording the, the record. Uh, me and Mike and Adam were in Chicago working with Johnny K who did the last two finger 11 records at the same studio, which was just coincidental um, and kind of a, a mind fuck for me. Um, he had done some stained records. So Mike suggested him as a producer. So here I was again, back in Chicago with Johnny, but with Mike and Adam. And I don't know, I guess it was nearing the end of the record, um, you know, preparing to put it out. We didn't have a name. So the three of us um, started thinking of names and we just threw a bunch of names in the hat. Um, it's fine. Looking back, a funny thing happened was stained, you know, one, one word, then three days, grace, three and finger 11, two. 
um, each of us picked the opposite. So like, I think Mike picked the name with three words. I picked something with one and uh, Adam picked something with two, you know, and we were all kind of laughed at it later. Like, did you realize we all did that? But we, we went through a few names. I think at first, um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think Adam was really the, you know, he was going to really choose in the end. Him and Mike, first of all, I'll have to say that um, even though I was there, it was really Mike and Adam that it was kind of their band. I don't know if I knew that in the beginning, exactly the way, the way the band started and the way it was sort of sold to me. I thought I was a little more of a key member of the band, but um, essentially I was just a hired guy in the band, which I found out in real time. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it was Mike and Adam that were going to, you know, run the band and make all the decisions. But Adam liked the name Asonia at first. I remember I hated that. Um, there's a song on the record called uh, King Nothing. We were thinking about calling the band King Nothing. Uh, me and Adam both, it's funny. I always wanted to name a band Oliver Twist. When I was a kid, Oliver Twist was like my dream band name. While we were in the studio, um, me and Adam had a lot of these moments um, in our friendship. He says to me, he's like, you know what, dude? I've always uh, dreamt of, you know, creating a band called Oliver Twist. And I was like, are you fucking with me right now? He's like, no. I'm like, dude, I've dreamt of using that. that that's my like band name since I was a little kid, Oliver Twist. Get out of my like, head. What? Yeah, we had so many of those moments, uh, you know, during our, our span of, you know, hanging out, playing together. Um, we, you know, we were like the twins of, it was very strange. But yeah, St. Nasonia, Adam inevitably came up with that name. And um, yeah, it, it was just derived from three of us throwing a bunch of stuff in the hat to be honest i can't even remember what saint Nasonia is off the top of my head it is a real saint i don't remember the backstory on who or what or why but uh there is there is a saint Nasonia. so stain's album break the cycle was one of the first albums that that meant a lot to me like mm -hmm. I, I related to that angst and that anger and and it, it felt like Aaron Lewis was speaking to me directly. So that's a big, that's a big album for me. And Stain's one of my all-time favorite bands. At what point did Mike become a part of that? So at first it was is you and Adam jamming yeah. and Mike comes along. How did you guys think of him? And at what point did he become a part of that? I remember uh, Adam saying that Mike had gotten in touch with him um, during us just in the very beginning. Um, I don't remember at what stage, but it was just me playing shows with Adam and he, he did mention, Oh, Mike Mushak from Stain got a hold of me back then. Mike, um, I guess Aaron had st stopped doing the Stain thing to do some country stuff. So Mike was going to make a record with a whole bunch of singers. He was going to get Corey Taylor, um, Ivan from five finger and Adam was on that list of guys. So he was just going to put out a record of songs, each song with a different guy. Um, so him and Adam spoke and, stained were actually he was playing with jason newstead at the time funny enough mike was uh on tour with jason and they were playing in toronto at the molson amphitheater and adam and mike got together to discuss working together and um i know mike had some ideas and i think they just hit it off right away um the idea of writing songs after that i think mike flew down or th someone they hooked up at someone's house either mike's or adam's and they worked on I think they wrote fairy tale at that time and they just, uh, you know, felt really comfortable writing songs together. And, you know, Adam told me that he's ha had a bunch of songs with Mike. And before I knew it, um, I was heading to Chicago to start working on some songs, but I didn't, I hadn't really heard any of the songs till I got to Chicago and we did pre-production there for, I think a month or something. Then I went home, th all the stuff that, um, not that I wrote, that Mike wrote, but we started having some um, ghost drum tracks too. I went home and, you know, learned the songs and then we came back and actually tracked the drums. So it was, uh, it was, yeah, him, him and Mike, it was really inevitably Mike reaching out to Adam. And then I was already associated with Adam. So the three of us sort of, you know, came to the studio and started the band. And if we flash forward to what's going on more currently today, um, mm. you recently had the opportunity to fill in on drums for Chris Daughtry, who's one of the biggest, mm. you know, rock dudes on the planet. This guy sold millions of albums, 
that guy can sing that that dude has a set of pipes uh, how did that opportunity present itself and I, I we started the podcast by me asking how good does it feel to get out and play again i guess yeah. to add on to that now that it's actually chris daughtry that you played a couple shows with how yeah. awesome was that uh you know chris is chris used to be in a band called absent elements back in the day and he used to play a bunch of finger 11 songs so when we were recording the self-titled record in Chicago, um, our a and guy was working with Chris, who at the time, I don't know if he was on American Idol or just before or just after, but he, he was just doing his thing. And I think he called, he either came to the, I was actually asking Chris about this the other day. He couldn't remember either. He either came to the studio or, or he called us at the studio just to you know, let us know he's a big fan. And, and we didn't know who he was. There's was this guy with our a and guy. I think Greg was like, hey, this guy, Chris, wants to talk to Scott. Or maybe he brought him there and he wanted to meet the band. So that was our first introduction to meeting him. And soon after, we were doing festivals. His first song came out and it was a you know huge hit. Um, and we would see him at festivals and sort of just became acquaintances. And we knew that he was a big fan of the band. And um, Fast forward a few years ago, Nickelback were here in Detroit and I went to see them to see Chad and the guys and uh, Chris was opening for them and sort of reacquainted with him again. And every time I see him, I always say, hey, if you're ever looking for a drummer, you know. So uh, a couple months ago, uh, we were just in touch and he needed someone just to fill in for a couple shows. And, uh, you know, he, he reached out to me and asked if I was available. And it, it was kind of like just going out there with a, with a buddy, the, you know, a friend of mine. And uh, so I learned some songs and went and played some shows with them. But, it, you know, it's like we're, we're kind of just buds. And uh, I hadn't met his band. I got to know his band and they're awesome guys. So, um, yeah. So I, I'm actually heading over uh, to Europe with him in a few days to fill in a few more shows. So, I, you know, I'm doing the Download Festival with, with Daughtry and uh, a few other festivals. But um, it is just a fill-in gig. I'm not. I'm not the drummer of the band. They do have a drummer. I'm just, uh, he, he's had some other commitments. So I'm, I'm lucky enough to be asked to go play some shows with him. And um, this time around, I'm getting to go overseas to do it. So again, extremely grateful, um, but it's just a fill-in gig right now. So we're at a part in the interview that might be a little bit more difficult to talk about. We're, we're going to get pretty personal here. So um, sure. you're, you're pretty open, honest, transparent when it comes to your history um, with, a, with addiction. So mm -hmm. how young were you when, when drugs started to be a part of your life? You mentioned to me, you know, I, I've always been an alcoholic or something like that in yeah. passing. Yeah. Can, you, can you go back to the start and, and we can weave through there to here? Sure. Well, I, you know, I grew up uh, in an alcoholic family. Um, you know, ever since I remember, since I was a kid, getting together with friends was always, you know, get, trying to find alcohol and getting drunk until you threw up. That, but I think, I mean, I don't know if that's really unnormal for a lot of, you know, early teens and teens. Um, you know, going through high school, it was, you know, smoking weed, smoking hash, drinking. Uh, again, nothing different than a lot of other kids. Um, but even back then, I, I do remember, you know, it was drinking was, I was just always drinking to, you know, there was no stopping, I guess, drinking until it was the next day. Um, even if I threw up, it was drinking to me meant getting obliterated where a lot of other friends, I remember just, you know, it was a few drinks, having fun. And at the end of the night, the night was over. I would be the guy that even when I was a teenager, they'd be like, dude, you know, time to go home. I was always, uh, you know. I guess I always was an alcoholic. I was born an alcoholic. So, um, you know, and as I got into my twenties and stuff and, you know, moving out on my own, um, you know, different drugs, cocaine became more around, you know, at that age, <clears throat> I was saying I was playing in bar bands and stuff. I was never a big drug guy, but it was around. So really it, it came to a point where anything that was sort of around, I would do, but I never really had a, you know, a habit, but always throughout that it was drinking, you know, I was always, I was always a drunk and into finger 11's career. I mean, uh, we always drank and we were kind of known for it. Um, a lot of other bands would tell us we were the band at, at a lot of those festivals we would play. We were the guys that everyone would be in our dressing room and we would be, 
getting fucking wasted with everybody. And it was fun back then we were young and, but it was, I guess, to an alcoholic like myself, it was, you know, a perfect storm for me to sort of sneak into that world without being noticed that, you know, this guy seems to have more of a problem than maybe the rest of us do. It's tough because that's, that's celebrated. Like as a, as a musician, as a rock star, I mean, you have, all those bands going back in history that are documented as partying and drugs and drinking and girls. It's like, that's expected of you. It's enabled. It's, it's celebrated. That must make it even harder. It is. It's the, you know, it's the worst environment for um, an alcoholic or any sort of addict until it's addressed. I mean, these days there's a lot of sober bands touring, but you know, also in my mid twenties, and I don't know if I knew I was uh, had a problem back then, because like you said, it's what everybody did. I would just seem to be doing it more or just taking it to the extreme. Um, but yeah, that's sort of how it started. And it just um, progressively got, I guess, worse for me the older I got. And, you know, just uh, there was never enough, you know. And, and with with bands on tour, you you get a rider, which is where you can ask for certain things, food, drinks, whatever will get you into the peak state to have your best performance. That's what yeah. the promoter provides to get the best out of you. And you hear crazy things like people need certain color M&Ms or yeah. uh, JLo needs everything white. I need a white room, white couch, white whatever. You never know what's actually true and what's, what's right. tabloid stuff. But that means that you guys can actually on your rider ask for alcohol. So it's not even costing you anything to drink as much as you want. It's provided. Yeah. We, I mean, we would have every night, two cases of beer, bottle of Jack, bottle of vodka and two bottles of wine every single night delivered to us, you know, in the dressing room and on the bus. So there was always on the bus, you know, four or five, six bottles of Jack to grab a bunch of vodka. And then in the dressing room, you know, cause not every night they would be drank. So you just keep saving them. And yeah, we just always had uh, an abundance of booze. I do remember when we were recording, um, I guess them versus you versus me, I think it could have been the self title, but we were keeping all of the vodka bottles that we drank and we would buy these huge gallon ones at the studio. And I remember near the end of the sessions, there was so much vodka that even us guys in the band were like, holy fuck, we we drank that much in three months. It was like kind of staggering the amount of vodka that we drank. So um, I I only like to speak about myself and my own stuff, but um, yeah, I drank a lot of vodka in the studio too. I I guess I'll, I'll say that, but yeah, it was, it, it was always something that I think I didn't know was as bad as it was until it was worse you know and and you actually quit drinking when you got married but then you ended up doing drugs kind of to compensate is that correct yeah i was i quit drinking and i didn't do any um at that point i was a full-blown alcoholic and i drank every single day for years i mean whether i was home alone home you know on tour i literally got drunk every single day and i quit cold turkey um thinking that I needed to change. And for some reason, right around that time, I discovered painkillers. So I quit drinking and then immediately started taking painkillers, which are, are so addicting. I, I you know, became really um, addicted to them very quickly and then started taking a shitload of them, which I took enough of those things to kill, you know, a, a fucking cow. And I, I don't know how your tolerance just gets going. And I, and it just got to a point where, if you didn't do that stuff, you would get so sick um, that I, I was a full on, you know, I, I was a full on secret junkie that nobody knew. When when tensions with the band got worse, that kind of triggered more depression, um, you know, more more addiction, mental health. At that point, yeah. you're diagnosed as bipolar. Um, h- how do you regulate the super highs and the super lows of being bipolar? Well, I mean, just to go back a bit, I, I, those guys didn't know, I think that what was going on, some of the turmoil with a few of us in the band, I don't think they knew how that was affecting me the way it was. Um, but yeah, I was, I I felt literally tortured at the time by it, what felt like the demise of, of some of our relationships or the way I was communicating with some of the guys and, uh, you know, it really affected my, my mental health for sure. 
when you're already an addict, um, th th that's just like, you know, adding fire, you know, to, to an inferno already or to a bunch of gasoline. It was, it ramped everything up and uh, certainly, you know, made, probably made those end days worse than they could have been, you know? Uh, so what was it? You asked another question that I jumped off track on it. Just how, how you regulate the, the highs oh. and lows of, of oh, being well, at that at that point, I wasn't diagnosed as bipolar. That still was years away before. Um, so I would have the highs and lows that I had. I, I didn't really know that they were out. You know, I was either super, super low and everything was uh, as dark as could be. And uh, or I was manic and I was, couldn't stop talking fast. And I was shaky when I talked. And it was uh, that always felt strange to me. But I always just thought I had anxiety or something. Um, you know, so yeah, it was the two extremes were always there, but I don't know at that time if I recognized that they were anything in particular than just a good day or a bad day. So at, at you know, after, after finger 11, you already mentioned that you became friends with Adam Gaunch or you're already friends, but you reconnected yeah. with him and you live close together. You're hanging out. Adam is known like a high, you know, lots of publicity about his, his issues with drugs over the years. Did two rock stars um, that became friends that both have a history of drugs. Is that an environment that kind of enabled both of you to, to maybe get worse before you got better? Well, you know, I always, I always am very, I guess I, I always, I'm I try to be responsible enough and try not to ever talk about anybody but myself because I'm the, I can only, um, you know, I, I just think it's only the right thing to do is just talk about what I've done. Um, certainly, certainly I got worse in, in an environment. Um, I don't know if it mattered who I was going to be around. Um, but I think it was being away from the finger 11 camp there was a, a new sense of i could be a little more free in my behavior um and maybe the people that i was hanging around at that time it didn't really matter who it was um probably propelled me to do to do even more of that stuff but i think you know just speaking as two guys that just had uh, come out of two successful bands um i think that there was a lot of emotion going on that, to be honest with you I, we didn't really communicate that we were both um going through our own stuff, um, not only in our personal lives as well. And, uh, sure. That would be a perfect storm for anybody, but, um, for sure it was a perfect storm for me. So things, things got so bad that there was a suicide scare. There's the psych ward. Can you dive into those a little bit? Yeah. Well, you know, that came after, I guess I'll, I'll backtrack a bit. And I do like to be very, um, honest and upfront about all this stuff because you know for a long time it was embarrassment and shame and now that i've thank god got to the other side i like to talk about this stuff to try to help others um so you know there wasn't just alcohol and there was oxycontin there was methamphetamines there was cocaine all those drugs were being used in, in my system uh you know sometimes all at the same time so i mean i was a a raging mess and what inevitably it got me fired from St. Asonia. Um, I look back on my behavior in the last year um, of, of that band. And I, I mean, I was, I can't even recognize myself in some of the, the pictures and stuff. And, you know, at the end of our last tour, we did with disturbed at the end of that, I was um, gently and politely told they were going to go in a different direction, but ultimately I was fired from the band. That was something I never talked about in, in interviews like this for a few years because it was embarrassing and it was full of shame. Now I look at it as um, really a changing point in my life. Um, it did get a little worse after that just because I was going through that denial of it. Um, during that time when it was at its worst, you know, there was a moment where, you know, to be straight up with you, I was just thinking about hanging myself from the tree and I, and I, and I went out to do that. Um, thank God it didn't you know, there was a, my family and police and fire truck and all that stuff got me there. And from that point, I was admitted into a psych ward. And, uh, and then they, you know, they ask you a million questions at those places. And for a few days and at that point is when I was diagnosed as bipolar. So it was the, that moment was the start of my recovery and healing to, to first of all, find out 
um, what was going on up here and to address it and uh, to also start addressing uh, my addictions and get help for it. So not only was I, you know, diagnosed with on the mental health side, that's when I finally went to rehab and it was time to start, you know, dealing with all this stuff. And part of dealing with all that stuff was, you know, coming clean with everybody and, and doing stuff like this. And for me, it's like super freeing and, uh, you know, just to talk about this stuff. And again, if it helps anybody out there, then it's worth it, you know, but there's just, there's nothing to be ashamed of to me in that stuff, because I mean, a lot of people go through this and like you were saying, a lot of people in this industry go through it. And, uh, I think the best thing I can do is to talk about it because there could be someone younger than me that's going through it and, you know, and hiding stuff or hiding anything, um, you know, secrets will just inevitably they'll kill you, you know? So the more out there you can be, you know, with my loved ones, with my family, and because I've had a somewhat of a, a, you know, a life where people know stuff about me, then I just let people know this element of my life too. So that's why I talk about it. And I try to be as honest as I can, even though it's, you know, some of it's embarrassing and shameful. You, you learn to, you know, that's the past. And, uh, you know, the recovery programs that I do now are, you know, you, you don't sort of run from the past, but you, you know, you do acknowledge it and you, you got to move on from it. Yeah. You, you, you can't get sober until you've made a conscious choice that this is it. Like I right. want, you have to want to like all the people that yeah. like, you know, I should quit smoking. Then they don't quit. You have to, you have to make yeah. the decision mm -hmm. for you. You, you hit rock bottom and yeah. decided that that was a solid foundation to build a life upon. Uh, do you remember kind of the, a moment where you go, this is it, man, this is it. Do you, do you remember what triggered the turning point that you've been good since then? I think it was the moment of surrender. Um, even when you know stuff's, uh, the smoking um, metaphor you just said is perfect. Even when stuff's going bad, I think you, a lot of times you're doing it uh, because somebody else telling you to do it. Sometimes it's court ordered to do it. Um, sometimes you're giving ultimatums from your loved ones to do it. But, um, you know, for, for me, I had to get to a point where I, I had to look in the mirror and say, man, uh, enough. I can't, I don't even fucking recognize that person looking back at me anymore. I don't want to be this person anymore. And literally getting on my knees and just saying, I'm done. I fucking surrender, man. Just somebody, something, please help me. And as soon as I said that, honestly, and I meant it, and it was a real surrender, um, doors started opening spiritually in real life and, uh, and the process began. And it was a, it's been a long one, but, um, all those years of abuse and stuff, if you think all the years you spent doing that recovery doesn't come overnight. Um, it's always a thing that's always evolving and growing and it takes time and patience. Uh, so Russell brand is very open about his history of, of addiction. And he's, yeah. he, he helps a lot of people with his transparency. Uh, mm -hmm. I read his book called recovery and it's him sharing his version of the 12 step program from alcoholics anonymous, mm -hmm. um, which gave me an insight into what that's like. And, you know, I'm not a recovering drug addict, but all of us have some form of addiction to something, whether sure. it's, it's love or food or sex or whatever. Sure. Um, did you mention you went to rehab, but it, was there a certain philosophy or ethos or program or something that made sense to you that allowed you to have clarity on what steps you believe that you could actually follow to sobriety. Yeah. You know, in rehab, it's not a specific thing. There's a, you know, you learn a lot about yourself and then you, you go to outside. Um, there's a bunch of different recovery programs that, that you're open to there. Um, for me um, doing, you know, being in a 12 step program, like Russell was, has, has worked for me. Um, and really has changed my life. But, you know, there's a lot of things out there. There's a, I know there's some Buddhist recovery um, programs. There's, I think, I think as long as you're open to, uh, like I said, to surrender, um, you will find whatever's going to work for you. But, um, you know, the 12 step program for me has um, 
completely changed my life and it's uh, it's what keeps me sober and healthy today for sure. One of my all time favorite books is called a million little pieces and it's about uh, a recovering drug addict and he's writing from rehab and it's just, Mm. it's just completely transparent clarity on what it's like. It's the first time I could actually put myself in the shoes of an addict. And one thing that, that really hit home to me is he said, an addict is, is always an addict. Like once you're an alcoholic or a drug addict, you're that yeah. for life. You don't stop. It's that every no. day you have to make a choice to not yep. give in to the fact that you <clears throat> are an addict. So it's not Absolutely. that you stop craving alcohol, that you stop drugs. It's something that is now lifelong that mm-hmm. is a moment to moment, making the right choice over and over again, remembering that there's something that's worth more than the quick high that you could get if you reverted right. back to it. Yeah. Does that remotely make sense as someone that actually knows what it's like? Absolutely. You know, they say that, you know, your addiction is right out this window and it's not only there waiting for you, it's doing push ups and it's getting stronger. And if, if you open that door, it will, it will be back stronger and better than ever. And, and this, this is true for not just for me, but I think for everyone, if, yeah, once you're, uh, you know, if you're an addict or an alcoholic or drug addict, drug addict, you are that for life. And, you know, what's really helped with me and what I try to, you know, uh, people that are just kind of new to recovery, you were just saying like moment to moment, sometimes just getting through one day is uh, a lot easier than thinking, you know, like, Oh my God, I can never drink again. Or sometimes people think of events coming up like Christmas or Thanksgiving. And it's hard to picture how am I going to be able to not drink and stuff at those kind of functions. And it's, it's much easier just to worry about right now, today, sometimes an hour, this hour, um, and trying to just get your head to your pillow that night and the next day starting over. So that, that Thanksgiving day or that Christmas day will come and before you know it, it's just dealing with with that as another day. So trying not to, you know, future trip too much about stuff and just and by doing that, it makes you present as well. So, I mean, I can enjoy this interview with you now and be present and um, not worrying about th- the future. So some of these philosophies for me, you know, don't just keep me sober and stuff. They 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 enhance my my present day, if that makes any sense. So I have a quote next to me on my vision board that I think is completely apropos for what you just said. So I'm going to read it here. So sure. it's from Og Mandino, mm-hmm. who's a best-selling okay. author amongst other things. It says, there is power in the words one day at a time. Anyone can carry his or her burden, however hard until nightfall. Anyone can do his work, however hard for one day. Anyone can live sweetly, patiently, lovingly, purely till the sun goes down. And that is all that life really means. Beautiful. Absolutely. That's, yeah. uh, that, that's some good wisdom right there. Yeah. Uh, that's somebody that's obviously has, uh, has done some recovery in his life, you know, and, and probably it's great that he has quotes on walls. I see Jordan Peterson behind you too. That's a, another full of wisdom. Uh, someone that's full of wisdom, but yeah, it's a lot easier to, uh, to focus on today than two days from now or three days from now. And, and because of that, for me, I mean, I've become, uh, I, I think I've become a much better musician than I've ever been. I'm more focused and present, um, about my craft than I've ever been. And I've really, um, created some of the best friendships, uh, of other musicians of my whole career. In, in this last uh, few years of, of recovery. Um, there's a lot of people out there that, that I've grown up with, in, you know, in my travels that are also sober and, you know, and in recovery and sometimes guys that are struggling that could use help. Uh, and it's amazing the, this huge circle of, uh, of musicians and not just musicians, you know, people in the entertainment industry uh, and not, it doesn't really matter if they're in the entertainment industry. I'm just making the point that a lot of people that I've met in my travels, I'm way closer to them now than I've ever been. Some guys I've known for 20 years. And now, I mean, you know, I'm better friends and I know more about their lives and more about their families. And 
I'm in touch with them more on a daily basis than I ever have been. So all of that and all of those relationships are all due to me hitting rock bottom and then getting here, you know? So there's, there's a ton of blessings in hitting rock bottom. You know, you, you can't see it at the time, but if you're able to claw your way back up, I, I do believe that you're a better person, you know? If we fast think, forward, if, if we fast forward to today, you look happy, you look healthy, you're maybe. sober, you're helping others get sober. Why is it important to you that you do share your story and that you do help others? Right now I look old and sweaty. <laughs> I hate that this screen so I keep staring at myself, but. Uh... <laughs> so as a heads up, you have every reason to feel feel sweaty and, and run down because we, we're over the three hour mark. So we're wrapping wow. up, but you have a story that needs to be shared in its entirety because there are people that need to hear this. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. And what go back, ask me that question one more time so I can focus. <laughs> so the, the question is now that you are sober, yes. why is it important that you're out here helping others to also achieve sobriety? A few reasons. I think, I think when I was younger, I didn't have anybody, um, you know, any, any direction or anyone to, to show me sort of some of the, the pitfalls that, that are, that were certainly ahead of me that I fell through. Um, and really this place in my life, it's a really great place to be. So I, I want others to be here. You know, I, I want, when I see others struggling, I know that if they're, you know, happiness is attainable again and, and peace and surrender and all that stuff and gratitude is all right there around the corner and you can grab it. Um, and so if I can just be a, you know, a helping hand, um, like others have been helping hands to me and still are, then, uh, it's really bigger and more important to me than any music or any drum part or any record. Um, to, to help another human being struggling is, is the ultimate gift. So in the same way that I've been helped and still get helped, you know, it's, you just pass it along and you want to try to help others too. And by doing that, it's, it also keeps me in tune with my recovery. And, you know, like you said, it's a daily thing. So uh, I just don't, you know, I don't want younger musicians or anybody else to, to feel alone in that stuff. Cause I know it's, it, it's a dark place. So um if anyone ever hears that message, um, you know, they're not alone and there's a lot of places they can go. Um, and I'm one of them, you know, and if, uh, and anyone ever wanted to reach out to me through your podcast or through, you know, social media, man, I would always be there to, uh, listen and try to help in any way I can, because others have done that for me as well. And life's better like this, man. Life's a lot better like this. The pandemic has been really difficult for a lot of people struggling with mental health, um, myself included as someone that's an extrovert, someone that's social used to run. I used to run events all the time, maybe two or three times a week. I'd have 20 to 30 people over at my house. Like it, it was all about community. And then the world right. says, actually you live alone and you're going to stay alone for two years. And it just ravages you as yeah. a person, right? You lose your yeah. community, you lose your identity. So for those of us that have been struggling with mental health during the pandemic. A lot of people have turned to drugs. Um, mm -hmm. The numbers, there are more, this, this could be incorrect, but this is what I've heard. There are more people that have died from suicide during the pandemic than COVID itself. So I'd have to verify that, but I've heard that, which is staggering. So for those people, so our listeners that are at home, maybe they're still struggling with the mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're turning to drugs. They don't know any other way to feel better right now. What advice would you give to those people? Oh man, uh, seeking help. I, I guess there, there are, there are places, uh, there are programs that will save your life. Um, you, you gotta, sometimes you gotta reach out and, and someone will grab your hand, but you gotta reach out. Uh, and once you do, um, you, you'll find that there won't just be one hand. There will be an army of hands. They're waiting for you. And there's a lot of people that, I've been like, you know, a lot of people have been isolated like that. And you'll find a lot of people that are like yourself that are going through the same shit as you and have, you know, maybe gone deeper into drugs and stuff that 
have had the exact same experience as you that are, are right around the corner from you, literally probably around the corner from you, uh, a zoom meeting away, a phone call away. Um, you just gotta, sometimes you just gotta be the first person to, to reach out. Um, and once you do, you know, you'll never, people will never let you go, but it, it is a, it's been a really hard couple of years for people, uh, for everyone, you know, and, yeah, not just uh, suicides. I think drug overdoses uh, have gone through the roof and, you know, top put the fentanyl into that mix. And, you know, it's, it's a really hard time in Canada and America for, for all these, you know, for young people dying and the, yeah, I guess I, it's hard to say what, how I can help there, but there is help out there. And, uh, you know, you, like I said, you just need to, Re, you got to just extend a hand and there will be someone there to grab it. If that makes any sense, you know, it's hard to give advice on this stuff because, you know, it's emotional. It's a very emotional thing, but um, I wish I could, you know, help more people, but um, you know, I try to do everything I can in my life to help others as I have been helped, but I've lost a handful of uh, really great people over this last two years to both those things. Well, this, this podcast will be seen or heard by thousands of people. And, you know, your story could be that change, you know, that, that catalyst, that uh, turning point for, for somebody that, that allows them to realize that they have a problem and to accept it and to uh, reach out for help and, and, and get better. So you might be helping a lot more people than you think. Yeah. Well, that's, as I said, if anybody that does hear this reaches out to me and, uh, and has any of those questions or, or, or needs help, I mean, I will always uh, try, to, try to respond and help in any way I can. My last question about that part of your life, um, would you say that your wife played a big role in your recovery? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say it. I know my wife saved my life. Um, you know, I think when I felt abandoned and you know, even, you know, getting fired from the band at that moment in my life, um, I felt there was nothing left. Uh, she really, and that was entirely true. I, I, you know, I had my family back home, but, um, I was down here in Michigan and there was, you know, she was the rock that stuck with me and it didn't just stick with me. She, uh, I think she saw the good in me that that could come back, you know, and she's, uh, she's been with me the whole way through a lot of dark times, you know, she believed in me and uh, I've been really lucky to have her. And, you know, I think a lot of, you know, partners, men or women um, in these scenarios would have, would have ran away a long time ago, but she's uh, chosen to stick by my side. Um, So yeah, I, I definitely, she saved my life for sure. So you have, you have a son that's almost two years old how has becoming a father changed your life? Well, you know, I had some practice because I'm a stepdad. Uh, I was a stepdad first. Um, so I, I, you know, I got used to being around um, kids and like, you know, getting kids ready for school. And so, you know, I'd never had any of that in my life up, up to that point. So it's different having a baby, a newborn baby. I don't know if you can ever fully be prepared for that. Um, it's hard to describe, man. I, it's changed my whole life, my whole perception of life. Um, just seeing, you know, seeing something you created, learning and growing and looking at you like you're, you're everything, you know, you're it's protection, his or her protection. Um, it's an amazing feeling. It's a lot of responsibility and sometimes it can be terrifying, you know, but uh, I am, embracing every day, um, being present every day and just in wonder of it, you know, sometimes it's frustrating (laughs) and, uh, I I laugh every day, man. I'm always laughing and my son makes me fucking howl. (laughs) He's such a, it's just, it's amazing. You know, a little life form growing that you create is just, it's amazing. And it's funny enough. He's already banging on drums. I don't know what that is. I don't know why, maybe just cause they're here, but there are guitars here as well. But for some reason, this little one and a half year old keeps grabbing my sticks and, and hitting my electronic drum. So I mean, how can I not love that? And it's pretty amazing. He's got that drummer DNA in him. Do I, I don't know. Do your kids think 
that you are a do they see you as a rock star or are you just some schmuck in the house that puts food on the table uh definitely some schmuck but you know my stepkids uh they know like the videos and stuff so they can go to youtube and they see stuff it's not like a rock star thing i think it's just um i don't know, i think it's just interesting to them they're kind of like oh you you do that as well but they're not a I don't know. They're not, I'm definitely not a rock star to anyone here, but um, I don't know. I, I don't really know. I, they definitely are aware of, of that side of me, but it's not in wonder. It's more just curiosity. They're curious why people actually care about their dad hitting some, <laughs> hitting some items. Yes, exactly. So we're, we're at the final stretch. We're at the final stretch here. I have some, some of the more deeper, philosophical questions here to wrap up. So if you want, we can wrap rapid fire through them with shorter yeah. answers, whatever you'd like. Yeah. Um, do you still have any musical dreams that have yet to be achieved? Anything still on the music bucket list? Oh man. I mean, there's so many things, but I'm not sure there's a, a list, you know, I just, there's so much music left um, to create, I think. And there's so many more experiences uh, for, you know, to travel and to play for new people. I, I don't know if it's, yeah, I couldn't list a specific bunch of stuff, but it just seems like, you know, the, the cliche saying, I just feel like I'm getting started. It certainly feels that way. You know, they, there's a lot left undone and um, a lot of, you know, stones left unturned for sure. When you look back on your life and your career, what are you most proud of and most grateful for? Um, geez, I, I would say one of my, my career. Huh. I'm proud and grateful. These are the I, tough questions, man. Yeah, I'm ending with the tough ones. I know. I guess, I mean, I got to say my son, because my career has led me to my, to my family, I guess my success um, and, it, you know, whatever that success is in whatever form has uh, brought me to my family. So I would say it's all goes in hand in hand. So yeah, my answer would be my family. Awesome. And this is, this is a, a tough one. Mm -hmm. What do you believe yeah. is the meaning of life? What is the point of all this? Why are we here? Rich, what's going on? Uh, gee, love, love and, you know, the universe, man. I think using that third eye, I think we, we are not great at that, us humans currently, but um, finding peace and love um, in our lifetime and not just in ourselves, but uh, if we can get that in our children, um, try to get that in our neighbors, you know, that is for me, you know, by the time I'm done in, on, in this world, I, I hope I've um, at least passed along some, you know, peace and love to my family and to other people. So as cheesy as that may sound, that's my answer. <laughs> if, if we could go back in time and you could sit down next to your 10 year old self, so there's cute little 10 year old rich long before he bleached his hair sitting there and you could share words of advice. So you've had a lifetime now of, of, of highs and lows of triumphs of failures of, of training and mentorship and lessons. What advice do you give 10 year old rich to help him on his way? I think I would, um, I think I would tell him to listen more, uh, to shut up and listen. And, uh, at the same time, don't be afraid to speak. That would be what I'd say. Shut up and listen, but don't be afraid to speak. I got the cheesy answers. <laughs> I'll take, I'll take all the cheese today. So, um, man, we've, we've covered so much over, you know, three hours and 15 minutes. Yeah. Is there anything else that needs to be said that we have not covered? The floor is yours. Is there anything else that we missed? It's like at the end of Hot Ones. This is your time. The floor is yours. That's what. Uh, I don't think so, man. I, I, this has been an amazing three hours, and we have covered a lot. And I, I don't know. I, I, I'm very impressed with all of this. And damn, you've done some serious work. So yeah, I got nothing. 
That's good. That's, that's, that's the right answer, I guess, for me to feel like I did my job where good. no, no stone has been unturned. Um, you, you mentioned earlier when, when we were talking about you helping others through addiction and sharing your story, you mentioned if, if anyone needs to reach out. So where can people find you on social media? Is there, is there a website? Is there a Facebook page? Is there yeah. Instagram? Do people slide into your DMS? Is that the best way? Yeah, I do both. Uh, you know, just my name at Instagram and uh, Facebook. I try to answer, you know, any, certainly anything addiction related. I, I, I make sure to, to get back to people, but yeah, Rich Beto, Instagram and Facebook. And as far as I know, there's no fake ones. So I don't know. It'd be kind of cool if there were fake ones. I think that's the next like level. An honor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if anyone has uh, any stuff like that to, to, to talk about or ask about or need help with, um, I would certainly try to be there for them to, to try help. So as we wrap up, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge you for your pursuit of mastery on the drums. You've spent a lifetime <laughs> becoming becoming the best drummer that you can be um, by you uh, aiming high, by you dreaming big and actually having the courage to pursue that dream. That shows the rest of us musicians what is truly possible, that yes, someone can can have a vision and follow it through and actually have a, a platinum or multi-platinum album can actually make incredible music and leave their stamp on the world. Um, I also want to commend you for your courage and your transparency with all the stuff with addiction and recovery. Uh, that's very important. Not a lot of people um, are willing to put themselves out there. And, and I, I know that that'll help a lot of people. And I guess the last thing I would say is that me personally, uh, I'm a lifelong Finger Eleven fan. Like I've been a fan for 21 years. Wow. I, I road trip to see you guys. I, I, you know, I saw you in 2000. I saw you in 2008. I had all the albums. I learnt your wow. songs on guitar. I bleached my hair. Like this sounds horrible. Now I said, no, I'm I love such it. A, fan, a fan girl. Like I said before, love fan girl. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> So this, this was a treat. This is, you know, this is for the listeners, the finger 11 fans saying a Sonia, Sonia, I'm going to butcher yeah. that for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> but it's also for me as a fan sitting down with someone that I'm a fan of and getting to ask the questions that I've always wanted to know. So this has been, uh, you know, a, a, a privilege for me, it's an honor to, to have, you know, going on three and a half hours of your time. I, I think this is one of the best episodes that we've done in the two plus years of the podcast. Oh, wow. And um, I just wanted to make sure that you knew how much this meant to me as we wrap up. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been great getting to know you uh, via our messages back and forth. And I, I, I feel like I know you even more. So next time we do this, it will have to be in person. Um, over some coffee or some tea or some pop a hot cup yeah. of cocoa yes yes i, I will, and I, that will definitely happen i look forward to meeting you in person and man i i'm just uh i'm blown away by all the all the work you put into this interview i i would say the best interview i've ever done and i mean that amazing that's that's the highest praise i can receive so um so that's it hey to our to our listeners to Rich's fans, to everybody listening. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you on the next episode. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and I'd love to hear from you guys. My goal is to grow this podcast organically where you're giving me feedback on topics you'd like me to cover and guests you'd like me to interview. You can reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J-O-E-L. And on Twitter at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message. And I'll see you on the next episode.